It's no mic over there. Huh? You can ask the microphone. <laughs> Speaking of the mic, it's better. Are we ready to go? Mark, are we ready to go? That means yes. <laughs> I heard voices. I think they're working on something for Tommy. Oh, I should turn my phone off. Not Here he it. comes. Cheering you on. Hmm. A brief rain show is to start in 20 minutes. Oh, I forgot my umbrella. You might know this might be one. <laughs> so we're getting a hurricane this weekend, or what's going on with that? Has anybody yeah. noticed? No? Maybe a tropical storm, but rain. I don't know. We'll get one. It's hard to get very frightened about something named Fred, and I don't know why that's true. <laughs> That's true. What about it Fred Krueger? Ah, well, that, that's true. <laughs> there is that. I don't know. Fred's the name of my favorite beagle. So I can't get that's afraid of Fred. That's a perfect name for a beagle. Jerry's <clears throat> sure out. Huh? I'm not sure. Okay. We'll wait. I have a big event in Orlando where we're doing ride and drives on Saturday. So I'm like, mm. stay over in the Gulf. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's why I'm not like worried about hurricane. I'm I just you, don't. Yeah, I'm hoping it. for a west track, just going going west. West meaning what? Belize or <laughs> do we know? <laughs> it could go east, actually. Mm -hmm. Are you driving lots of electric cars? We've got um, R2 that we're bringing over, mm -hmm. um, and then I think other people are going to bring, they, I think she's got some electric motorcycles for people to ride, which I don't even know how they're going to do that. I wouldn't trust myself on someone else's motorcycle, but hey, yeah. you know. And then other people just with static vehicles to kind of show them off. So. Yeah, I don't think I'd trust someone else on my motorcycle. <laughs> I'd move that around. I wouldn't trust myself on your motorcycle. <laughs> no, me neither. We'll see. Hopefully it doesn't get all rained out. Oh, we love our electric car. Mark, are we okay to begin? You can knock three times. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome to the Sustainability Committee of City of Tarpon Springs this Wednesday, August 11th, 6 p.m. Uh, like, can we get a call to order, a uh, roll call, please, rather? Chairperson Dory Larson. Here. Vice Chairperson Paul Robinson. Here. Member Taylor Mandelou. Here. Member Denise Menino. Here. Member Karen Gallagher. Here. Member Robin Sanger. Here. Member Carol Mickett. Here. All right. So our first item on the agenda today is a presentation by um, Tommy Kiger and Ashley Tobin on the greenhouse gas inventory update. Take it away. Oh, I take some Tommy's getting ready. I'll introduce him. So you might remember him from before. He's our wastewater division manager. Mm -hmm. He's also a professional engineer in the state of Florida. He's got great uh, expertise with all things technical. And uh, we're really glad to have him helping us out with this model. Um, he's been working with Ashley. Uh, great teamwork to put this together. They've updated it for you. So that's what this presentation is, is an update. Thank you uh, very much, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm uh, Tommy Kiger. I'm an uh, uh, engineer by training. I'm actually an environmental engineer from way back in the day. And uh, I'm currently the wastewater division manager here at the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, in uh, my other free time, I've also been involved in the American Society of uh, Civil Engineers. And I'm on the AWWA National Water Loss Committee, so uh, focusing on uh, water loss uh, issues and sustainability for small and mun uh, municipal governments on water utilities. And you were formerly with? Yes, and formerly I was with the, I spent seven years at the state of Florida with the Suwannee River and Southwest Florida Water Management Districts, working on regional water supply planning, uh, working with small utilities on a variety of issues, including alternative water supply and water conservation and things of that nature. 
Um, but thank you very much for having me here today. Um, uh, Chairman, uh, I'm sorry, Chairwoman Larson, uh, members of the committee, and also uh, Mr. Smith and Ashley for uh, inviting me to speak today. Uh, today I'll be covering the material on our citywide greenhouse gas inventory update, but I would particularly like to thank uh, Ashley Tobin uh, for, uh, in our public services department for all of the help on this. She's been instrumental to this process uh, in compiling and uh, getting all this information from the different uh, city departments and putting in the tools and uh, orchestrating this whole effort. So uh, thank you very much, Ashley, for all of your help on this. All right, so today we're going to be providing you with an update on the, the 2019 baseline for the greenhouse gas inventory. We last spoke about this back in January. We were about uh, three quarters of the way through the process, and today we'll be providing you with the updated 2019 numbers, and these are final numbers at this point. There it is. Okay. So uh, just a quick recap on a greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, how does one go about creating a greenhouse gas inventory? The first step is to establish a baseline. And in this case, we chose 2019. Uh, we started this effort back in 2020. 2019 was the most recent year that we had a complete calendar year uh, worth of uh, records. So it made sense to start with the most recent year with all the data available. Um, the next step, once you establish a baseline year, is you collect data on energy consumption in your municipality. Uh, in this case, this heavily weights towards fuel purchases, fuel consumption, and electricity use uh, within the municipal government. Uh, the next step is to take all that information and convert all that energy use into equivalent tons of CO2 emissions. And uh, that can be quite a technical process, but luckily there's a national, well, really international tool called uh, ICLEI uh, which is sort of a standard that uh, software that is web-based that allows you to input all your information in a consistent way with all the other utilities and municipalities, and uh, it converts all that energy consumption into mm. equivalent tons of CO2 emissions on a consistent basis. Uh, the next steps that might be for the future would be to forecast future emissions based on growth, and then you might make a plan to, with goals to reduce emissions and energy consumption over time. And uh, you would continue to monitor your energy consumption and your emissions year over year and continue to do this sort of process as your projects are implemented to see how you're tracking and how your, uh, your actual energy consumption and CO2 emissions compare to what your original forecast was and uh, how your goals are for being implemented with the different projects that are being uh, constructed or put into place. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, I mentioned ICLEI. ICLEI is the greenhouse gas inventory tool that we elected to use. Uh, again, it's an online tool for municipalities. There's two different tracks that you can go down. In this case, because we are just starting off on this effort, we elected to go with the government operations track. It focuses on municipal government operations. So this is this work was limited to our uh, city government, you know, the fire department, police, utilities, uh, general government, uh, energy consumption. And the other scale would be community scale track, and that would include things like net commuting miles and things like that, like looking more at the community as a whole. Uh, we elected to start off with this uh, government track because it was what we had readily available. It was a little bit smaller in scope, and it's also actionable. It's the things that we have more direct control over here as city employees, and so that's where we wanted to start. Um, all right, so here's our progress to date. So we have finished collecting all of our data, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, some of the things that we collected since we last spoke to you in January uh, are our electrical generator fuel consumption. Uh, that was sort of outside of the scope of our normal uh, fleet operations, so it took us a little while to hunt down that information and the different fuel invoices and things like that. A big fish that we had really been hoping to get that we had mentioned earlier was the uh, fuel consumption for the waste management fleet. Uh, which is our solid waste contractor here at the city. Uh, luckily, they have extremely good records, and um, they were, <coughs> excuse me, they were able to provide those to us uh, shortly after our last update, and so we've been able to take those records and put them directly in the ICLEI tool. Uh, one other uh, effort that we were working on was uh, other city contractors, and particularly our landscaping contractors for the golf course and. Uh, public works and the cemetery and things like that, looking at their fuel use as well. Uh, we also went through and did a final round of quality control on the data collected, just sort of making sure everything was adding up, hunting for missing records and things like that. And uh, since then, we've uh, finalized our 2019 greenhouse gas inventory and 
now we're gonna see some results. All right, so here's our uh, initial cut for citywide greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Tarpon Springs Municipal Government. Um, it's broken down by sector, and as you can see, our overall, well, I'm not sure which one you guys are looking at, and the laser does not hit on the screen. So we're gonna just speak to the slide. Um, the, uh, the overall citywide greenhouse gas emissions is just shy of 10,000 uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalent. That's not all CO2. Obviously, there's other things in there. Uh, one kind of oddball thing was like net nitrous oxide emissions from the wastewater facility, which is sort of inherent to any sort of wastewater process. That was a very small quantity, but uh, it's just as an example of how the ICLE tool can take something that's not CO2 and convert it into CO2 equivalents for uh, simplicity's sake in comparing your progress over time. Um, the largest uh, sector for um, municipal emissions was the water and wastewater utilities. Uh, these are obviously uh, some of the services that we provide here that are most energy intensive from a pumping uh, and water treatment standpoint. Um, the next largest sector was, uh, it was very close between the vehicle fleet and the other buildings and facilities. Um, so uh, the buildings and facilities were about 1,800 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent and the vehicle fleet was about 1,700. And then you get into like sort of smaller categories like uh, street lights and traffic signals. Those tend to be relatively energy efficient already. They're you know, smaller, they're, there's a lot of them, but you know, they're just ultimately light bulbs and processors and things like that. And uh, lastly was our solid waste facilities. That should be noted that the, uh, because most of our solid waste is uh, contracted out through waste management, most of the solid waste uh, contribution wound up in the vehicle fleet. And uh, the solid waste facility is really related to the energy cons and fuel consumption just at our yard waste facility, which is quite small. So is that why there isn't any dark blue on the chart? Uh, yes, you can't see it on the chart, but if you look up into the, uh, the table up there, you can see it's the fourth category down from the top as a solid waste facilities at five, five tons of CO2 equivalent. And again, that's really primarily just energy consumption at the solid waste facility. There we go. And uh, here's a quick overview of, you know, how the water and wastewater facilities compare to all of our municipal buildings for uh, citywide energy consumption. Uh, this pie chart includes all of the energy consumption for uh, city facilities. Uh, the water utility is called out in the bottom there at just shy of 7, 000, 7 million uh, kilowatt hours of energy consumption in 2019. The uh, wastewater facility was a close, was a second uh, mm -hmm. at about uh, 4.5 million kilowatt hours. And the other municipal buildings were about 4.3 million kilowatt hours of energy consumption. Uh, Within that category that we have the pie chart broken, or that, that <clears throat> red bar on the pie chart, the other municipal government uh, use, uh, we did break that out into CO2 equivalents for you to see here on the right. And so you can see uh, where, where everything is going that's not related to our utilities. So uh, some of the key categories would be parks, rec, leisure, and the cemetery. We kind of bundled all those together as an easily understandable category. Uh, Grid losses is actually the second largest category. That's something that's largely outside of our control. Uh, grid losses are related to the, trans the losses in energy uh, tr being transmitted over distance. So that's some a number that, or it's a factor that we got from Duke Energy and it's related to where our closest uh, energy production facility is uh, relative to our city facilities and also the types of grid infrastructure they have in place. So the only, that can go up or down, but it'll, trail fairly linearly with overall energy consumption. Uh, the next category, uh, Is oh, I'm sorry. that a lot, 6,900,000 and so kilowatts? Is that a lot, is that average? I mean, how do I understand these numbers? Um, I think the biggest thing that I would be looking at in this category, it is, we did look, I, I, we knew we were gonna get that question and uh, we did look for some benchmarks and other municipalities data mm -hmm. as far as uh, energy consumption, you know, kind of across the board. And like, uh, ultimately, you know, we were having a little bit of trouble. We found some energy sources or some data sources. We're hoping to maybe have some better stuff in the future. But for right now, we're really focused on uh, our government. It can be very tricky to compare across uh, different um, uh different types of municipalities. For example, if you went down to um, 
oh, let's pick one, uh, maybe like Bel Air, right? They're you know, a little bit smaller than us, but they also don't have a water plant, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But they're importing all of their water ultimately from Tampa Bay Water, which is located on the other side of Hillsborough County. So it, it really kind of does become a, a, an apples and oranges type of scenario, depending on what sort of water treatment you have and what water, uh, how much water consumption you have within your utility or within your utility service area and you know how far it has to be transmitted. Um, it's going to be different. So if you have a long linear utility, you're going to have more pumping costs than you would if you have a very small compact utility. That's sort of outside of your control. But what we can control is we can look at it year over year and compare to ourselves. I think from a benchmarking perspective, that's the healthiest way to go about it is to look at, we made this many million gallons of water in this year, and we had this much energy consumption, and we can track that over time to become more efficient for our unique system. Tommy? Yeah. Did it seem like a lot to you guys who were doing this study? I mean, when you look at it, did that seem like an outrageous number, a moderate number? I mean, looking at with, with your professional eyes, how, how did you perceive these numbers? Well, uh, I will say I wasn't surprised because I'm in utilities and we do pay the bills. So mm -hmm. uh, that was not particularly surprising. Uh -huh. uh, we do tend to have a fair, and we have to budget for this every year. So we have a fairly good pulse at least once a year looking okay. at our overall energy consumption as to what we're budgeting for in subsequent years. Um, I have done some preliminary, no I have looked at some numbers as far as like uh, unit production costs for like water and our utility and stuff like that. And it's, it's like fairly equivalent compared to other utilities that I've seen. I've seen a lot of different water uh, production numbers through my experience in the water loss uh, committee and working in throughout Southwest Florida. Um, you know, so it, it was, you know, not terribly high, not terribly low, kind of online for the type of water treatment that we have, which is reverse osmosis. So I'd like I, to add it, a few thoughts too. You know, one thing you have to consider with our water is what we're starting with. We're starting with a brackish, almost salt water. So that's gonna take a lot of energy to convert it to fresh water. So to try to compare us to another facility that starts with fresh water, say mm -hmm. inland and in, in um, Lakeland or something like that, it's not really a fair comparison. But back to Tommy's point, it's no coincidence that a lot of our solar efforts are going into the biggest mm -hmm. energy user in the city. And this made it quite clear. Uh, this is one of the mm -hmm. interesting things about this baseline. So as Tommy mentioned, now we get this baseline, we can track, is that 6.9 going to go mm -hmm. down with mm -hmm. more and more solar implementation? Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a function of flow and the water quality. If the water quality gets saltier, it's going to take more energy. But this is a starting point. You really can't tell, you know, like going on a diet, you don't really know until you weigh yourself the first time. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. That's kind of what this is. Gotcha. Thanks. Absolutely. But Thank have you, you set any goals? Like, like if you use the diet analogy, you have a goal, I want to lose 20 pounds. I mean, are you looking to reduce this to, let's say, 4 million? or you're just gonna see what happens when you introduce new technology? I think the first step will be to see what happens, but I know that early on, that was one of Dory's comments, that she wanted us to have goals mm -hmm. to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by a certain percentage by a certain year, and I think that before you can really do that, you need to know what those numbers look like. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and one key step too is as you as you track those numbers, it's important to normalize for yes, yeah, as, as Paul said, for your production and your flow. Like, uh, for example, at the wastewater treatment facility, if we have a particularly rainy year, we're going to have more water to treat. That's just how it is, and so the flows might go up, you know, like five percent or something like that. And you would expect that energy consumption would go up correspondingly. Or on the water side, if you had a particularly dry year and you have large demand for irrigation, that would be something that could potentially drive up your overall production numbers and you know, your energy consumption would go up accordingly. So it's important to normalize across a variety of different climate years as well. And Thomas, um, is there a seasonality to the use of electricity, for example, at the reverse osmosis plant? Because we have drought followed by mm. rainy season and soon to have drought followed, extreme drought followed by deluge. Do we anticipate this is going to get worse over time? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't speak to that briefly. I, I'm not intimately familiar with the month-to-month -month variation in the water plant budgets um, or, you know, electricity consumption, but in general, their peak water use does occur, you know, or their peak water production does occur uh, in those drier months when you have high irrigation demand. So, uh, you know, they'll have longer production runs and uh, to meet 
uh, demand for folks in you know late April, May, early June, and uh, you know when you get into July and it's raining like crazy, uh, you know people need a little bit less water. Uh, but as you get into August and September on the wastewater side, your numbers start to go up a little bit. And so, you know, as you get more rainfall and you have more, uh, more return flows to the wastewater facility, <coughs> so your, uh, our energy consumption peaks in the, in the wet season. Do our sources of water change with drought? Does the source get saltier? It can. Um, that's our continual quest is to get more wells so that we can rotate them and uh, turn them down, you know, if we can in the drier months, or at least not turn them up too much. Mm. But that is a risk. But it is also something we have to monitor and make adjustments based on what we're getting. Do these numbers um, factor in reclaimed water that come from the county? Uh, let me go ahead and get ahead. Actually, I was really trying to focus there on other municipal uses. Um, okay. But we can go ahead and jump forward to utilities. You guys seem particularly interested in that category. So here you can see a little bit more of a detailed breakdown uh, on that uh, chart to the right uh, from the uh, you know water and wastewater uh, CO2 emissions. So again, this largely tracks uh, kilowatt hours of energy consumption. And you can see the water utilities, the, the you know, larger, the largest bar that's a little bit over 3,000 metric tons. Uh, and that's energy consumption for the reverse osmosis waste or reverse osmosis water facility uh, and the distribution system. Um, <clears throat> the wastewater facility is the next largest category at just over uh, 2,000 tons. And then uh, just it's a little bit of the nature of the tool. They do kind of break things down into like categories that uh, the average Joe might not break them down into. But uh, you know, like fuel gener diesel generators, a lot of folks might lump that in with the overall facility numbers, but in this case, because it's fuel consumption, not energy, it's called out separately. Uh, same thing with grid losses. Um, and we have uh, very small quantities of uh, energy consumption for like, uh, we have a, a couple of propane generators and things like that. Um, and uh, stationary fuel consumption for, uh, for diesel pumps and things like that. Those are for like backup pumps and bypass pumps for the wastewater facility largely and the wastewater collection system in case something ever happens and you need to put a pump in place, you know, and uh, you don't have energy uh, power there. Um, <clears throat> but again, the, there you can see the general breakdown of uh, water versus wastewater um, emissions uh, from the different categories. Any, any questions on this one? I know this one's gonna be quite a, quite a bit to process in one go. So is the reclaimed water in this? That's yes, the reclaimed water production is included in the wastewater utility grid electricity consumption. Okay. Uh, everything goes back to one account, uh, to a couple of accounts that are all paid for out of the wastewater fund. Thank you. Yeah, my apologies for not getting back to your question. No, that's sooner. okay. I was like. All right. Um, <clears throat> the next category that we wanted to look at was uh, fleet fuel use. Uh, here, you know, we did kind of lump everything together between gasoline and diesel, but uh, that pie chart uh, on the left demonstrates the total citywide fuel consumption in gallons. Again, that's diesel and gasoline all lumped together uh, just for simplicity's sake. Uh, but you can see that the police department's the largest consumer of fuel. It makes sense. They're 24-7 facil uh, service. You know, they're out there keeping people safe and also giving out traffic tickets at 2 a.m. and our construction crews, we really try hard not to be responding to things at 2 a.m. unless there's an absolute need to. So, um, uh, you know, so the police is the, the largest user. The next largest category is public works. That's heavily weighted towards um, their construction equipment and that sort of thing, like, you know, uh, excavators and dozers and uh, larger trucks associated with transporting that equipment around town. Those just tend to use a little bit more fuel because they're larger pieces of equipment. I think and the street sweepers are in there too. Yes, the street sweepers are also in there. They are one of those things that they, they're running whenever, you know, whenever people are in working, you know, five days a week, uh, presumably. And uh, fire was the, the next largest category, followed by the water and sewer uh, utilities uh, there up in the top, right, uh, top left. And uh, other general municipal government, like the Project Administration Division, uh, uh, yeah, the cemetery and uh, parks and Rec and things like that uh, are also are the, the smallest uh, category other than the, the water division. And again, you can see it, there's a quite a bit of a breakdown here on the uh, right. Uh, this is all of the citywide vehicles. Uh, you will note that we do have some electric vehicles in here, particularly our golf course electric carts. 
Uh, and you can see there the third one down from the top, very small user. We have quite a few of them. I would be hard pressed to tell you the exact number of golf carts we have, but they are all electrified. And uh, for that reason, 75. The answer is 75 golf carts. Wow. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but they, uh, they're driving around whenever, just like any other vehicle, whenever the golf course is in operation. And, uh, you know, they are a very s relatively small con uh, contributor to our CO2 emissions because they're electrified. Um, light trucks, this, this kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what our vehicle fleet looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, the light trucks uh, includes like um, Ford Explorers and things like that that are like police cruisers uh, or patrol cars. Um, those have been kind of the general trend in police departments as folks trend away from the old uh, Crown Vicks, which have been discontinued a number of years ago. Uh, folks are going to like smaller SUV, uh, to those mid-size SUVs, which count as light truck in this category. And then you can see also like uh, waste, uh, waste management is about the fifth and sixth categories down. And it, it is interesting to note that waste management has a partial uh, natural gas fleet. Uh, so uh, they've been transitioning to that over time as they phase out older vehicles. And uh, so we did have some natural gas consumption in this inventory as well. So when, when is there a policy in the city about when um, vehicles are in an idle mode, you know, when people stop. I know police cars, they keep their cars on even though they're stopped and doing their paperwork and all of that. Yes, the um, fleet does have an anti-idling policy. Mm -hmm. I will say there are exceptions to it. Some vehicles draw too much amperage with all of their electronics to turn off. Um, in other cases, if it's in the summer and the air conditioning, mm -hmm just to keep the crews from overheating. You know, there's some things, but definitely when you can, the idea is to turn off the, uh, off the engine. Excuse me. Yes. Um, so just a question about waste management um, and the diesel. Did, would the diesel they use, is that clean diesel? Do you know? Or is there a difference between consumption of that, what's the so-called clean diesel, the low emission diesel and regular diesel? The, uh, the answer is there is a difference between the types of diesel. We did ask those types of questions. Uh, um, I would have to get back to you as far as the, I, I just don't recall offhand. It's been a little while since I've touched the waste management numbers. Yes. Um, but uh, depending on what percentage biodiesel you're, consu you're using, it does change the, uh, the emissions. The, the overall emissions, like a lot of it's between like, uh, you know, 20% biodiesel and like, Standard diesel is about 5%, so it doesn't move it all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you don't have a lot of, uh, uh, like, pure, like, alternative diesel fuels uh, in this area, like, you know, like you might have in the Midwest where it's all, like, corn-derived or something like that, uh, or in some cases, you, you know, even to recycled cooking oils and things mm -hmm. like that. But um, the answer is yes, it does count for that in the tool, and um, if you'd like, we can look into those numbers in a little bit more detail. No, I just was just curious to see if it made a difference. Thank you. And what percentage of the fleet is electric? That's a great question. I would have to get back to you. I th it's a, it, honestly, right now, it's a fairly small percentage. Probably the largest category is really going to be the electric golf carts at this point, just by number of vehicles. We bought some electric cars. I think there's two, yeah. right? Two. Out of? Maybe 200 vehicles. Two? Yeah, we're working on 1%. Uh, 1%? <laughs> I thought you, you, got, you got like a bunch. No, but not a lot of other cities have a high percentage yet either. We're really looking towards, and Dory could speak to this a lot, but um, we're really looking for the market to uh, give us mm -hmm. more choices. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I thought you might bring up is the light truck gas. I mean, that, that would be like, okay, what can we do there? That's a mm -hmm. big opportunity. And yes, I is. think industry's coming around. You got Ford advertising now, their electric F-150, I mm -hmm. think. You know, we're looking at things like that. That's probably a few years out before we can start looking at mm -hmm. buying those in quantities. But uh, we also want to see things demonstrated. We don't want to be mm -hmm. the guinea pig. We've had some bad experiences, not on the electric side, but on the gas side, buying a new manufacturer and then having major troubles with a new model coming out. So I think once been twice shy with that, we'll want to see some good demonstrations, which might be a year, and then we could jump in uh, mm -hmm. more fully once we get that. And Can they go drive the F-150 on the 28th? All right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Ford's doing like a big tour across the country, so. 
I'll report back. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, that's awesome. Yeah, and I will say on the light truck thing, the, the picture's not so bleak as it would seem. Uh, one of the reasons that, you know, a lot of folks have transitioned into those small SUVs is just because over time as fuel emission standards have increased, uh, you know, uh, a Ford Explorer might now be getting 25, 28 miles per gallon as a, with a four-cylinder, whereas even uh, 10 or 12 years ago, you know, a Ford Crown Victoria might have, for a, for a police vehicle, might have had a v, V8 that was getting, you know, like 10 or 12 or 15. So uh, even though you're transitioning to, like, larger, higher-profile vehicles, the overall uh, miles per gallon has continued to increase across the entire range of produced vehicles in the U.S. Oh, I'm going the other direction. All right, so how is this information useful? So um, you've already asked some questions about our vehicle fleet and uh, what we can do with this information and starting to set goals. So I can speak to us in the wastewater division. Um, we did take a hard look at this data after we compiled it. We put a lot of effort into collecting this information. And so we looked pretty hard at our vehicle fuel consumption to see what was going on. And also checking for those idlers, you know, like is someone uh, not driving a whole lot of miles but using a whole lot more fuel than they were, uh, than you would expect. And uh, we did, luckily we didn't find too much of that. So. Uh, or really any of that. It seemed like everything roughly correlated. The miles went with the fuel. So that's that's a good story right there. And um, But we did identify a couple of areas for some fuel savings over time. Uh, knowing that we can't turn over our whole fleet in one year, we decided to look at a couple of priorities. So we're currently planning to implement two new EVs, uh, you know, relatively soon over the next couple of years as we go to phase out a couple of older vehicles. Uh, one, we do have a 2012 Chevy Express cargo van. Uh, it's uh, not the most fuel efficient. Average about, I think the EPA rating is about 15 miles per gallon, but that's what they were about 10 years ago when they were making them. So that vehicle in 2019 consumed about 1,200 gallons of fuel. Um, and we are currently planning when that vehicle comes in for replacement to replace it with a new uh, Ford e-Transit, which is an electric a fully electric plug-in um, utility van that, uh, or cargo van that Ford's coming out with. Uh, it was supposed to be to market already. They're hoping to have it to market sometime later, the, like fall of 2022. Uh, but we'll be able to take that 1,200 gallons and turn it into zero. Cool. Uh, right. Hopefully in the near future. All right, so some of our next steps. So this information obviously was already uh, important, to, uh, uh, helpful to us in utilities and uh, we would like to begin providing these results now that they're sort of finalized to other departments for consideration, particularly on the fuel consumption information, uh, so they can start thinking about and planning for um, where they might make some improvements over time, just because it does help with their budgets and things like that in general. Yeah, using less fuel saves you money for other sorts of priorities. Um, we could also begin compiling our 2020 greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, we're through that calendar. We're well through that calendar year now. And so all those records are available, if not yet compiled. So uh, we could begin putting that together. And uh, then it might be an interesting exercise to begin comparing outcomes from 2019 and 2020 through, uh, through ICLE. Um, <clears throat> uh, 2020, obviously, we had partial implementation of the solar project at the reverse osmosis facility. Mm -hmm. So that'd be uh, one area we could take a look and say, you know, we're putting projects in place. How much is this helping? And uh, where do we expect to go from here? Mm -hmm. And uh, another next step might be to, you know, do our start monitoring performance each year. You know, let this begin begin the, be the beginning of an annual exercise, where we do a forecast from our base year, and then look at how we're, you know, you know, bringing that curve back down over time as we implement, you know, energy saving practices. But won't the um, data collected in 2020 be skewed a little because of COVID? Yes, that is the, that's going to be the nature of, um, you know, any sort of exercise like this. Again, you're going to have a variety of factors. Economic factor drivers are going to be very large. So I, uh, I will say I know that in the wastewater utility, we used quite a bit less fuel in uh, 2020. So your numbers could be dramatically lower. And you, it might not be unexpected to see a rebound in 2021 as things reopen. And, you know, we went to like partial staffing in a lot of areas. Uh, we deferred, you know, projects, especially early on the pandemic. So things weren't getting built for a couple of months mm -hmm. uh, that we were planning on. Um, so we were really on a really operating on an emergency basis. So, um, yeah, so th there would probably be a little bit of a drop off in in 2020. Uh, 2021 might be sort of a return to normal. 
but for some things like the the, the facilities, like mm -hmm. uh, you know, people were still using water, people were still using wastewater. The numbers aren't that dramatic. Our different. world and utilities pretty much has stayed the same. I guess that's mm -hmm. a fortunate thing for us. But mm -hmm. interesting. But one might learn something by looking at those numbers to see there might be benefits, like people working from home maybe can save um, emissions and things like that. So maybe you can actually see how one could use that from the COVID. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the case. And it, it is important to, uh, to make sure that you're keeping your scope consistent. Mm -hmm. So if you're having more of a remote workforce, you know, you can sort of, art, you might artificially reduce your energy consumption, but you're really just transferring out to someone's home. You know, so if you've got the PC and the phone and lighting all running and air conditioning in the middle of the day, you know, you might have some of that come down if you have a more remote workforce, but you might be transferring it out to people's homes where it might be a little bit more hard to quantify also. So it's, it's important to make sure that you're... Your vehicle. Oh, definitely. So, that helps. Uh, any other questions? I have one more question. Um, was this study um, funded in the normal budget or did you have a grant or something to do the study? Oh, this is a great, thank you for that segue. I did want to <laughs> brag for a second. I think we're one of the few cities, I heard Tommy say the only city that he knows of that we're actually doing this in-house oh. with tools that we um, were able to get at very low cost through joining this organization, I-C-L-E-I, -E pronounced ICLEI. Um, this was all the tools that they provided. And it was a, one of the main reasons we joined is because we could utilize something like this. Many other cities are using consultants to do this and are paying for it. So I guess the shorter answer is we didn't really need any budget for this. Mm, great. That's wonderful. So Ashley and Tommy should get a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess my question is like, where do we go from here in terms of like, when do you think we could set some goals? What are some attainable goals? Like what's realistic of like what we can try to reduce? I mean, it's, it seems like water is obviously is the biggest to try to tackle. So trying to educate residents about reducing water or, I mean, this is just, but this isn't, well, this is for, the community in terms of the water, right? Even though it's, these are city numbers, but these are, this is the water going out to residents, correct? Yes, so well, if yes. we are re educating residents about like, when you're using water, it's not just water you're using, it's electricity that we're using and carbon emissions that we're generating to make your water healthy and safe and clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna piggyback on, on Dory's question because not knowing or understanding how the treatment plant works or how any of the system works. Um, it's pretty hard to conceive of, well, how do you reduce the amount that we're using? Um, is there any way for us to have just even a clue about what that, why that number is so high? I mean, it might be, I mean, I, and I heard that we're reducing it. That's where we're putting a lot of our solar efforts is the operation of the plant, mm -hmm. but um, what is realistic for how for reducing that number, or is that just a pipe dream? No, I, I don't think it's a pipe dream. I do think it's, it, uh, you did say one kind of important thing. You said that this area is very high, but I think it's important to remember that this area is just high in relation to our services provided. So, right. um, you know, if you're in a larger facility, a larger utility, and you've got a public transit system, you know, that can be very energy intensive. That's one thing that's not a service that RC provides directly. And we also like don't operate a landfill, which could be another potentially large source. So it's only really um, high relative to the fact that most of the other services we provide are really just brick and mortar buildings, mm -hmm. right. um, you know. Uh, but you know. it is high, I mean, for every municipality, it is a big chunk, Yes. like in any city. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, water and wastewater consumption are a very key energy user across a, a range of municipalities. Um, I will say, uh, I bl we spoke last time about our per capita water use numbers, uh, and those are published, and we have been able to, com we can compare directly to published numbers for uh, other area utilities. I want to say we're at like uh, 
don't quote me on this, but I want to say we're at like 107 gallons per capita day. Mm. The regional target for the water management district is 150. Yeah. And so we're already well below that target. And we're actually well below the regional and the state average, I, as, as I recall. Don't quote me on that, but we could provide that slide again from the last uh, update. So we are making progress on water conservation. Um, Obviously, Ashley is implementing, uh, you know, water conservation program right now for like toilet rebates and stuff like that. There's always more we can do on, uh, you know, awareness and things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> but I, I do think that Paul uh, has definitely got us on the right direction with the solar energy. Uh, ultimately, um, you know, uh, all other things being equal, you know, if you have a reverse osmosis facility or really any water treatment facility, your energy use is going to scale relatively linearly to your production. And you have a limited control over how people use water. You have some influence and you can educate people, but ultimately, uh, you know, if you have more people, they're going to use a little bit more water. So uh, by, you know, taking that, you know, known energy consumption that's needed for the technology, the treatment technology that we have and converting it from a carbon intensive energy source to a carbon neutral energy source is, uh, that's, I think that's probably the most bang for your buck on, on that front. Mm. So does, does ICLEI have, oh. I'm sorry, does ICLEI have best practices in relation to reduction in that area? Yes, that's one thing that we did talk about last time. We were hoping to set something up with ICLEI, um, you know, in the near future, maybe to start talking about. Yeah, I wanted to say these are great like. questions. These are like next step questions. They're a little bit ahead of where we are right now, including the percentage realistic drops. So we want to, we just finished putting it all together. We want to show it to you. Mm -hmm. Next, we need to communicate it to with internally and also talk about that next step. Those mm -hmm. are great questions about what's realistic, you know, mm -hmm. in each area. What can we do? Mm -hmm. um, and then get back to you on that. This mm -hmm. is a work in progress for sure, and it'll continue to be over years. Um, I just want to add, too, since you mentioned solar, it is in this coming budget, another 650000 to expand another phase of solar. We've already gotten ahead with the next plan to put it out to bid, so we really want to get a jump start on that. So I hope we're going to be constructing something in six months if everything goes well. Mm. So, uh, How realistic is it that the entire um, reverse osmosis plant can be solar, like completely solar? <coughs> I don't know if we'll ever get to 100%. One of the challenges is that plant sometimes, many times, runs 24 hours a day. And mm -hmm. as you know, effective sunlight might be six or seven hours if you average the, you know, the low angle of the mm -hmm. sun, maybe six hours of full, full energy a day. So you've already got behind the eight ball there. But I do think that we can get to perhaps 40 to 50 percent mm. of the power. Mm. And we're not giving up on wind. I mean, uh, we're going to mm. keep looking at these different ideas. I haven't gotten around the idea of when a hurricane comes, what do you do with that turbine? Mm. <laughs> and we've got development all around that now, so it's going to have to be something lower mm. to the ground. Mm. But uh, we're not ruling anything out. I, I would love that to be 100 wouldn't that, percent. Be cool? Wouldn't that be cool? I would love tour buses to come and people getting off with cameras, taking pictures of them. That's a photo op. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have one question about water loss you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I don't know that this fits into water loss, but I recall that in our old part of town, a lot of the pipes are still old clay pipes where they're basically just tapped in and no, nothing really holding them together. And those, you know, as I recall, those leak like a sieve. There's really the, a lot of water loss to that. Have any of those ever been sleeved, or I know there's some there's a, a a way to sleeve existing clay pipes to 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 stop some of that water loss. Have have we considered doing that? Tommy, is that more of a sewer uh, side yes. of things? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Vitrified clay pipe is much more associated with gravity uh, sewer lines. Um, we do know that we've got quite a bit of you know gravity you know sewer that's still clay pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily inherently leaky. You know it, it works very well. You know and, until you know something happens that causes a crack in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know and so uh, it can be one of those things that you you can frequently have. You're more likely to have a break if you excavate an area around a, gra a clay line than around a plastic pipe. You know just because it's older, it's brittle, and that sort of thing. It's the nature of the material. Sure. But we do have a program that we fund to about a quarter million dollars a year for manhole and gravity sewer line rehab. Uh, in the last year, we've added on um, several new contractors that are doing exactly that, trenchless pipelining and manhole rehab. So we've added on engineered spray solutions, which 
we've been using for manhole rehabs. Uh, they're saving us quite a bit of money. Uh, in the past, we've seen quotes for you know upwards of twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars to rehab an old manhole, and now we're getting it in the five to ten thousand dollar range. So mm -hmm. we're able to get to more areas for the same budget, and also uh, trenchless technology from a sewer lining perspective is. Uh, much more cost effective when you can do it. You know, it's not always practical, you know, depending on what type of conflicts you have or if you've got a completely broken line, you know, that sometimes has to be dug up. But uh, we we are, you know, spending about a quarter million dollars in gravity uh, and sewer, uh, I'm sorry, manhole rehab each year. That, that's interesting. Thank you. Has the city ever looked into tidal energy? Mm, that's that's a great idea, but not... It's more not, consistent. Yeah. I don't think on our coast it works because it's not. We still have the the hot low and high tides, right? And that's what it's all dependent upon. Mm. It's not just water rushing in. You know, it's. I, I'm just that's curious whether that's been a an option that we pursued at all. Uh, th that's not something I'm aware that we've taken a look at. Um, Paul can uh, weigh in on that, but I, I do believe that Dory's alluding to, to something important here. And that, yeah. uh, just in general, you know, I'm not an expert on tidal energy, but uh, in general, I've uh, I believe I've read that you know those projects tend to be focused like in the the northern latitudes where you have like much higher tidal variation. You know, where instead of here, like our tidal variation might be between like one foot and three foot. Uh, of elevation and you've got uh, tides up north in like Nova Scotia and things like that that are you know six seven ten twelve feet per day and uh, so really that difference in elevation is what gives you a lot of energy potential and so we, we in general this sort of this area of the of the world is going to have lower energy potential for tidal than um, than other areas with larger uh, tidal variation I will say Denise that's thinking big mm-hmm mm -hmm. Yeah, really don't like it. Well, thank you very much. I think this was really informative. A lot of work going into it. Very much appreciated. Thank you so much. And excited to hear what what comes next. What comes so next? Thank you. Thank Great you. job, what both do you of you. Think Thanks. The timeline is to find out the 2020 data. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that, <laughs> uh, that I've already good. got one put out there. What, the, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Heading out to what eat. What do you think the timeline is for getting the 2020 data? Well, we literally just finished the quality control on 2019, the last few weeks, you know, uh, just hunting down those last few invoices and stuff like that. Uh, we haven't established a firm timeline yet, uh, but it, that is something that we're, we're starting to look at once we uh, get the 2019 numbers out there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next item, number two, is discussion about built environment results. Thanks, everybody, for getting those in. Um, so highlighted where we have majority, so four more votes. And are you pulling that up, Ashley? Awesome, thank you. All right, so in the first uh, outcome, uh, built environment one, ambient noise and light, there wasn't uh, enough votes for a outcome. And then same with local actions, there weren't, uh, there was the highest was three votes. So there wasn't anything uh, in that um, lo local action. There's been a suggestion in the um, commission to put lights in the trees in Craig Park, which would be in this, you know, ambient light. And <coughs> so I think that this section, I mean, I didn't, you know, rate this high, but now because there's a suggestion of putting lights in the trees, which really hurts the animals and hurts the trees and is something that is not a way to sustain the environment that maybe we should say something about this. 
Was it uh, Craig Park and also, or did they already have them in Mother Mears Park, or was it just Craig Park? I thought it was Craig, Craig Park, but um, I'm sure that if it's there, yeah. why not put it everywhere? I think, mm -hmm. I think I it was hear, Mother. I didn't hear Craig Park. I think it was Mother Mears Park. That Mother Mears, about. where's that? That's, That's the, the parking lot. Yeah. The parking lot. Well, the little the corner. Yeah, I know where, where the mural yeah. is. No, I thought it was, I don't know. But anywhere to put it, I think, is a mistake. Because if the birds, it affects the birds, it affects all of the animals, it affects the growth of the trees. It's just, in general, not a um, policy that is good for sustainability of the natural life. And it's not nature-friendly. It's yeah. not <laughs> nature-friendly. <laughs> How would you address that using local actions? Would you pick perhaps action number two? I don't know. I have to open my star thing to read it. It says adopt a community light policy, ordinance or regulations based upon local assessment. Yes. Yes. That sounds good. Okay. So that would be policy action two, which got three votes. So we'll just bump that up and add that to it. know how this <clears throat> this affects us I when we went go way back to when we went out into the community and we asked community leaders to kind of give us some input on different um, you know what they felt was important in their communities etc um, so this is way back you know when we first got started and um, one of the things was uh, that came out and somebody that I was speaking to was um, <clears throat> how how sustainability was going to uh, impact crime in, in the community, et cetera. And so my, my question on this was, what I found really interesting was, you know, I, at that point I didn't know, right? Because I didn't know where we were going to go and what we were doing and what have you. It was just more trying to get their feedback. But that was a very big concern of this person. And one of the things I thought about was they put in new lighting um, right up at that four-way stop at Spring and Grand, uh, or Orange Street and Grand and Spring, kind of like a mm -hmm. three-way uh -huh. intersection, what have yeah. you, um, because of some events that had happened prior uh, to. Uh -huh. And so that was kind of my thinking is that I think we need to keep in, in mind that some sort of lighting, whether it's, you know, trees or not in the trees or what have you. But, um, I mean, I can tell you on a, on, a, um, uh, on a several occasions, there's commotion and stuff and things like that going on in Craig Park mm -hmm. um, very late into the night. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, you know, different times, um, and and so sometimes more lighting is not horrible. It's just how it's how it's put in and presented and what it's doing. Like you said, impact to the trees. So is so. I I just thought I'd throw that out there. Some some of the comments were, you know, well, how's how are we working on crime? And I thought, well, gosh, perfect example. We were able to put a little bit more lighting in in areas that weren't lighted, bringing more attention to those areas. For people, so I think um, whether that has has any impact, what you, what you're talking to mm -hmm. or not, um, is there a way to put very nice lighting in or around the trees without actually harming the trees or the animals or you know that na that nature itself? So I, I just thought I'd throw that kind of as a a little That's bit really when we talk about it. I think mm -hmm. that there were the request was to put the lights in the trees where that I think is something to avoid but mm -hmm. to put like street lights up for crime I think is a good thing and I wonder if there are lights that are more nature friendly mm -hmm. yeah there, there are night there are street lights that are called night sky lights they have like shade yeah that lets it go down mm -hmm. but yeah. not mm -hmm. out and mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. Well, and I would think solar lights could play a part in some of that as well. No? I don't know. Anyway, I just thought since we're talking about, I, I, don't, I don't recall at this point um, hmm? what, I, what, I, what I answered for the built environment, because as soon as I got that request from Ashley, I was like, if I don't do this right now, my, I'm so busy that it's not going to happen. So, <laughs> so, and I already ha had been working on it, so as soon as I got the request, I was like, oh, she just did this five minutes ago, but I'm going to send it to her. Uh, <laughs> and then I kind of put it over to the side. So I don't remember what, you know, what my vote on that was, but I, I do appreciate that because I think, I think that it is important for us to think about ambient light. Um, 
but I think it's also important for us to remember that lighting is not always a bad mm -hmm. thing. I mean, if you, I walked, I, I walked home from the city down that way um, several times after dark, and um, and I appreciate having that light, those new lights up near the, that condo and stuff like that. So. Robin, do you remember? I'm sorry. There was a dark skies ordinance or something, wasn't there? That it's something is ringing a bell with that, but I don't. I'm, I'm not. Five, six years ago, yeah. maybe. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, if it's important to you all and it's something you want in there on the remember, this is like our checklist. Yeah. We can then look at that and report back on our status. Drill down in a little bit. I think that would be an important thing to do. How can we? not affect the nature nature birds trees plants with our lights but yet provide enough light for um, safety reasons mm -hmm. in terms of the types of lights you use what areas you do it in do we have do we know if we have a noise and a light ordinance we, we have a noise ordinance for yeah sure. let us research the light thing i'm thinking i remember i wasn't involved with it but there was concerns in craig park about light pollution and that we came back with something on that so uh yeah we'll find out i'd kind of like to know what the noise ordinance is too just because we know a local business owner who feels like he's he's being persecuted on a regular basis is a uh, uh, owner of tarpon strings mm -hmm. and um, they're just he built a big patio to be able to ha have concerts mm -hmm. um, on Friday nights or certain nights of the uh, weekend and is constantly g having the police called on him mm -hmm. and um, I don't know what the ordinance is so I mm -hmm. wasn't even able to say anything about it but. certain number of decibels I remember they had that at the tarpon turtle a couple of years ago, and of course, sound carries across the water too. But it was the residents, uh, or you know, complaining. So they have like a decibel checker. They go out and see how many decibels it is. Okay. And it's a time. A time and it's frame a time. Like a yeah, after eleven o'clock at night or something. We, like we don't that. appreciate the, the leaf blowers at seven oh. a, seven a.m. on a Saturday morning. Oh. But apparently, it's okay. <laughs> so the worst noise. Yeah. So <laughs> and you, know, you can actually call, and they'll tell you what the times are and what the actual noise. <laughs> I try to wait till 8.30. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Paul. I, yeah. I probably don't hear yours, but, but I will tell you. it gets too hot after that. I hear a lot of them. We hear a lot of them at 7.30. 7 uh, it may be the only time you can their leaf do it. <laughs> And, and it may be, and I appreciate that. So I do appreciate that there's actually an ordinance in there because there are people who can't sleep at 5.30 in the morning, and heaven forbid they put those lights out and it's light enough for them to be doing it, they'll be doing it then. <laughs> so. I know that St. Pete has been doing this noise issue for a long time because of Beach Drive and the condos that are on Beach Drive and all of the restaurants that stay open late with music. And... I can't remember the details, but they've been trying to come up with some innovative way to um, monitor the noise and not just with the decibels. So as we move along with this, it may be interesting to see, mm -hmm. to find out what St. Pete has come up with um, for issues like what you're right. talking you, about. You don't want to kill culture while you're... Yeah. <laughs> Doing something yeah. that's beneficial to to uh, mm -hmm. other people, it, it's a hard balance. Yeah. But mm -hmm. yes, people need to mm -hmm. sleep. And Absolutely, yeah. It is a difficult issue. Okay, so our to dos are to look about to check on the noise and the light ordinance and what we've got, and then I've put, I've added action two in there as a placeholder for for now. Mm. All right, so. Next item is uh, BE2 community water systems and um, outcomes one, three, and four all got four votes. So all three of those are in for, um, for the outcomes. And then for the local actions, there were five of them. So one, which is adopt a jurisdiction-wide management plan for drinking water supply, wastewater, and stormwater. And some of these we may have, so mm -hmm. I, just, you know, I'm, I'm putting that in there that, you know, we may need, to, you know, we may realize that we have some of these. Um, action two is adopt policies to ensure that jurisdiction has the authority to enact water conservation measures during periods of drought, which again, I think we might. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then seven, which is create programs to guarantee provisions of water for low-income residents. Eight, manage and upgrade infrastructure to reduce leaks in the drinking water system, mm -hmm. which we were just talking about. Um, well, I guess we were talking about sewer, not drinking water, but um, eliminate contaminants and achieve other local conservation goals. And then local action 11 is facility uh, and infrastructure improvements, engaging in restoring and maintaining projects for critical water bodies that provide w drinking water for the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Is that, Paul, given the sources of water, is that a realistic action? Well, right now our water comes from the ground. Yeah. It's um, brackish groundwater. Mm -hmm. um, so water bodies usually imply surface water, right. so it wouldn't apply to us. Um, so I guess that would be the short answer is it's kind of an NA action 11 for us. Hmm. So that, I, yeah, I, I was thinking that same thing, Paul, mm -hmm. that, that there's probably nothing for us. I mean, we may as well take 11 out if yeah. really, we do have well, well, it's well water. <laughs> protection programs that we're required to have and that's protecting mm -hmm. the land use around our wells and making sure so there mm -hmm. that is addressed and I'm surprised that that action 11 doesn't include that wording but huh. just know that we you know a lot of these things aren't just good ideas but they're actually regulated yes good. So. Paul I have a question about what, what was the action about um, ensure that residents have safe drinking water was there one that's or said something along those lines manage and upgrade infrastructure to reduce leaks in the drinking water system eliminate contaminants eliminate and achieve contaminants. other local conservation goals mm -hmm. yes so my concern is that i know we've got a lot of water testing at certain spots they t they test the water and it comes out fine but what about from when it goes from the city source to a resident's home and they might have old copper piping where the you know or they might have even galvanized piping to where if the if the slime that forms in there naturally that's a protectant or against the the solder joints that dissolves the 6040 lead because 6040 lead was a 6040 solder which is 60 percent 10 40 percent lead was used up until yesterday i mean not yesterday but you know figuratively speaking so is there anything in place to where the city can say yes our water's fine but to protect residents who live in older neighborhoods or older homes to make sure that what, what comes out of their ta tap is not lead contaminated or does not have uh, other things going on that they need to be aware of because we can, have sa we can have surety about our own water supply, but I don't know what's coming out of my tap. So is there any kind of a water testing, uh, a water testing program that we could provide? In fact, I was thinking about the, like with the ARPA funds that might be a, a great program to provide water safety at that at the householder's level. You know, using those types of funds, Infra it's it's infrastructure, but it's it's more resident. The ARPA yeah. funds are supposed to provide benefit to the residents. So that you we're already doing that with our RO plant and the things that we're doing for our water purification systems. But is there a way to, in, or if people are curious? Is there a way that they can, you know, we could lease some equipment for a couple of years and let them bring in a sample or two to, just to see, you know? Let me go back to the first part. It's an excellent question. And yes, the EPA regulates this and they do a very good job of addressing exactly what you talked about. In fact, the program requires us to take samples from customers' kitchen sinks mm. to address that very issue. And we have to um, get customers to volunteer. In fact, I've been a volunteer for several years. Um, but they do, they go through a lot of lengths to make sure that it's a representative sample. In other words, they make, they review our sites and make sure some include older homes so that we would catch those galvanized or other types of materials. And I will say the results, and they, they even give instructions to the customer, you, mm -hmm. you need to take this sample first thing in the morning after the water sat in the pipe all night long. Mm -hmm. Don't flush it. Right. You know, yeah. worst case, it's all worst case. And the results, I mean, we did fantastic, and I'd wow. be happy to share them with you all, but it, it, they do it all by 95th percentile kind of thing, and, you know, of all the samples, the 95th percent, if you sorted them all, mm -hmm. the, the top 95 percent number has to be less than a certain thing. And I, I want to say we are like a factor of five or more less than the requirement. Mm 
awesome. when we put all That's the results. So, reassuring. so you know, a lot of it goes to being proactive with our chemistry going into the pipes, mm -hmm. so that it doesn't pick up anything till you know when it gets to the house, and then you know any small amount there from the house plumbing is still within the threshold of the oh, requirement. That's really good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that's I feel better. <laughs> yeah, and we actually put a thing out to the public about how to, we don't provide lead testing for people, but, you know, if you're concerned about it, here's filters. And we actually went to Home Depot and wrote down all the ones that are available, and we said you can get these models if you mm -hmm. want to filter lead out and, you know, that sort of thing. And they're not real high cost, mm -hmm. so there are some opportunities, very low-cost ways for people to feel comfortable about it. Great, thank you. And where would you take your water if you want it to be tested? Yeah, it has to be a certified laboratory. And I think in the brochure, we might have even, I don't know if we went so far as to name them, but we told people how to find out. I think the EPA maintains a registry or something. So we gave them a contact for how to do that. I think it might be a couple hundred dollars for someone to do that if they wanted to. Could we provide it to residents? But we don't have the equipment to do that. We don't. We we contract it out. Yeah. All right. Okay, back to you. Are we good with water? Yes. <laughs> We're with water systems. Next is um, complete communities. So there were not um, any, there were three votes is the highest for um, outcomes. There were a couple of the um, local actions. So Local action one is um, demonstrate that the comprehensive plan supports compact and mixed use development. Again, I think I think we do have mm -hmm. that provision in our comp plan. Um, so with that may wind up being a non issue, but um, I think we leave it in for now. And then um, Three, which is uh, identify areas appropriate for compact mixed use development on the community's official future land use map. Mm. And then there was one that, that did not make it in that I wanted to raise, which is um, a design review for sustainable implications. So Where's like, that? Which one? Seven. Seven? Yeah. So seven is establish a design review board or similar appointed body that provides comments on the sustainability implications of proposed development projects. So mm. I was thinking maybe even like at the TRC process, having especially now if we're gonna have um, a sustainability position, having them sit on that TRC board and just be able to recommend like ideas for making the project more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily like as a stop gap or as like a, you know, you know, pumping the brakes on a project, but just mm -hmm. these are some ways that you could be more sustainable with this particular project as it goes through the process. So I would I would like to add back in action number seven. That's great. Mm -hmm. I think that's I really wonderful. Okay. What's I would mean? just caution you though, um, playing role of city attorney, which I'm not an attorney, but if you're having someone providing comments that aren't backed by codes, mm. and you're telling a developer basically to spend money to do these comments, I'm not so sure how well that's going to go, mm -hmm. how effective that's going to be. There may be some developers that want to have a good impression on the community and we'll do it even though it's not required. I think my point is you'd get probably a lot more mileage out of a review of the codes and making the mm -hmm. changes at that point mm -hmm. so that the review board implements or reviews the project against those codes. And the, the comp plan's being updated yes, right now. Yes, the so. land development code, yes. Yep. So um, I'm not so sure how effective Action 7 would be. I know it sounds like a good idea, but just the way it works, you know, I've seen RTRC, how they really apply the codes, and that's their whole role really is to say, well, this doesn't meet the code here. You need to do this, that, and the other. So that might fit better after the comprehensive plan is updated, and then there's some, some new guidelines, you know, to where someone could... Uh, but then if it's updated, yeah. it would already kind of be written into it. Mm. Mm. We could reword it to just say, you know, um, review developments, that, you know, specific to sustainability codes, you know, city codes or something like that. That would be good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. establish a similar appointed body. I mean, I think 
do we want to modify that even? Because I don't want to create a whole new. Right. I'm not trying yes. to create a whole new thing. Uh -huh. um, but you begin and establish a. What did you say, Paul? That was. Well, you could just say maintain a design review board that provides comments on sustainability implications according to codes. You know. Well, you know, we are now having a sustainability director. Is it a director or board member? I don't know. We're still going to have that kind of, yeah, that, that's <laughs> part of a conversation that's coming. Coordinator so, for now. <laughs> so that person could, could be the person that um, is familiar with the appropriate codes and would know what development, I mean, it would, I would think that would be part of her job would be to look at what developments are there and um, be able to, um, what new developments are happening and look at what's appropriate <coughs> for sustainability. I mean, that's the beauty of getting a person who is the sustainability coordinator. Or helping write it into the comprehensive plan. Right. right. Because that person that's in that position can't be making arbitrary mm -hmm. um, decisions, but it has to be written into and, and completely integrated into the vision mm -hmm. that we have. So what I did just now is I just added maintain a des instead of create, mm -hmm. maintain a design review board or similar appointed body kept everything else the same, and then um, implications of proposed development projects according to codes. Great. As I just ended, added at the end. All right, there we go. Um, moving on, uh, housing affordability. We did not have any outcomes. The local action that was identified uh, with five votes is action seven, implement programs to preserve and maintain existing subsidized and unsubsidized affordable rental housing in transit served areas, compact and mixed use areas, and areas with rapidly rising housing costs. All right, moving on to infill and redevelopment. There were no um, outcomes that were consensus. And there were, uh, for the local actions, local action one, Develop an inventory of infill previously developed brownfield or grayfield sites of greatest priority and potential for development or redevelopment. Can you explain infill, brownfield, and grayfield? Boy, I looked that up, and, I'll, and I think that we've got them in our community. I so believe you. You, I look just... at, you look at the, um, is it Manitou? Manatee yeah. Village. Oh, my gosh. That, uh, isn't that grayfield? I think so. I, that I was unclear about, but I did want to talk about that because before you develop a new virgin uh, area of the city, it seems really important to redevelop um, these asphalt fields <laughs> that we have sitting fallow, you know? But um, I will try to find the distinctions. Grayfield and Brownfield. Yeah, I just talked to Professor Google and he says, <laughs> Yes, thank you. Grayfield Paul. land is economically obsolescent, outdated, failing, moribund, more words I have to look up, yeah. or underused <laughs> real estate assets. Manatee so, Village. The Manatee Village, right. What's Manatee Village? The one, the it used one to be Win Dixie. Oh, across from that, Ace Hardware. Is that what it's called? But that's being redeveloped. Manatees are almost never seen on that property. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's so, such a gray field. <laughs> then what does it say for Brownfield? What does Mr. Google say for Brownfield? Well, I think Brownfield. My understanding is that Brownfield is just like derelict property that doesn't have I concrete think it's on it. I past contamination oh, yeah. site, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. I've got the, the EPA um, says Brownfield redevelopment can transform abandoned and underused sites into community and economic assets such as parks and plazas. So it's just uh, undeveloped. Um, hmm. But it... Oh. Mixed-use developments and homes. Brownfield properties are often centrally located in areas where infrastructure is already available, which can make them valuable properties for development. 
but they may have contaminants on the property. Yeah. So right. that's, yeah, that's a that's former the industrial or commercial site right. where future yeah. use is affected by real or perceived environmental it's contamination. Yeah. Trying to develop those in St. Pete down in the art warehouse district because a lot of that brownfield down there. Mm. Okay, so does that satisfy your question? Yes. Okay. Um, so then uh, action item two is develop an inventory of existing public infrastructure assets, current infrastructure conditions, and priorities for maintenance or rehabilitation. Action item four is use regulatory and design strategies to encourage compatible infill and redevelopment with a mix of housing types and neighborhoods close to employment centers, commercial areas, and where public transit or transportation alternatives exist. Oh, okay. And then action 10, um, got five votes as well, and that's perform proactive zoning enforcement and vacant lot cleanup or, per, or maintenance to improve the attractiveness of, of a redevelopment or blighted area and to deter crime. Mm -hmm. And then um, action item 11 was also in there, and that's um, target local infrastructure improvements to underserved and blighted areas to revitalize redevelopment and catalyze private investment. And my concern with um, with action item eleven, why I didn't select it, is is like gentrification. Like if we, mm -hmm. if we, I don't know. I just I can see how that would, by some members of the community, really, when they hear sustainability, this is what they think of, and this is what frightens them, <laughs> is that they would, you know. Read it. Could you read that again, please? Sure. Uh, so it's target local infrastructure improvements to underserved and blighted areas to re re to revitalize redevelopment and catalyze private investment. Yeah, that's the scary part. Private that investment, is. right? Right. Like property values right. go up to become unaffordable right. for the. Correct. So that was my like reason for not wanting to have action item eleven in this mm -hmm. action item 10 i could see you're trying to deter crime you're trying to like at least keep it mowed so that there aren't snakes or whatever but or you know what i mean like near in near like houses quality of life or, improving mm -hmm. correct area, mm -hmm. yeah but um Tom, i don't know did we say about nine uh it's financial incentives to incentives to encourage infill and redevelopment like the the area that we were discussing before the plaza is that is that relate to that? You know, taking a gray field and encouraging, giving some incentives for it to be redeveloped. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, so. I'm just curious whether that's. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to it. I'm scrolling through because I don't have three in front of me. It's nine. It's action nine. Action. Where would those incentives come out of our, our budget or the CRA budget? Do you know? Like. Depends where it is. You know, the CRA is a defined area. You're asking, right. is Manatee Village in the CRA? Mm. It's yes. close. close. If it's close. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, I don't know exactly where the border on that is. Um, yeah, the border is Mirrors. But it's on the other side of on the other side Alt of Mears, 19. Right? It does, how far does it go on the other side of Alt 19? You think the CRA is only on the on one side of... of That's what my... My Not question centered is centered on where? Safford Avenue. Right? Yeah. I don't. I'll have to look at a map. I'd have to look at a map. I thought it was both sides. Yeah. And I don't know either. But if it's not, uh, even if it's within the CRA, um, would that be budgeted with with CRA dollars, or would it be budgeted city dollars for improving that? That would be. That would. Where where would that find that? Where would that incentive come from? I guess is the. Do we have anything like that at all right now? Does anybody, does anybody know? Maybe that's a good question to mm, for yeah. planning department. Is mm -hmm. that who it would how go do we under? Incentivize, how do we incentivize that redevelopment? Well, uh, you know, the, C the CRA uses their funds for like facade grants and yes. things like that, which is a financial incentive Correct. to you know encourage encourage. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say infill or redevelopment, but to encourage you know the beautif beautification of our, mm -hmm. our you know keeping it up to speed as well as. Um, you know, things like they did with um, Silver King, 
mm -hmm. right, where there's an incentive for them to move into a property and maintain that property. They have rent right. discounts and things like that. So I think there is some sort of program. It, there are, I should say, there are some sorts of programs. I'm just not savvy enough to know what they are. So um, Dr. Robinson had it right. It, the CRA goes down to uh, mirrors to mm -hmm. the south, but it also is pretty wide. It's yeah, just on the east side of Safford all the way over to almost Banana Street oh, on wow. the west yeah. of um, Alt-19. Mm -hmm. And it continues all the way up to the Alt-19 bridge, south and then side. On the, on the hmm. east side of it, uh, around Manatee Village, how far does it go? Yeah, so all the way to... Where is that? Lin just to Lincoln? east of Safford. So yeah, it's just, just before hmm. Lincoln. And you pull it, till it comes to you. Yeah. How far north is it about? Right up to the old Pappas restaurant there, basically. Uh -huh. So, um, Dory, back to Action 11. Yeah. Can we modify it? I mean, I understand the fear of gentrification, which I think is a real one. But I also um, don't want to leave out investing and looking for improvements in undisputed underserved and blighted areas. So could you just stop, put a period after mm -hmm. the infinitive to revitalize instead and leave out the redevelopment and catalyze private investment? Well, that's why I wanted just action item 10 because I think that is doing the improvement but not necessarily for with the intent to Is there any blighted yeah, area where people live blighted. that they wouldn't want to have some investment? I mean, blighted areas tend to be food deserts. They tend to be shopping deserts. Um, private investment is typically a good thing in those places within limits. Well, let me speak to St. Pete because in the Art Warehouse District in South St. Pete where the Deuces are, this has become a big issue because um, in the Deuces is where is the old African American um, center. And they could not get any banks to give them loans or anything like that. Right next to it um, became, be, what's the art warehouse district, and artists started to have their studios there and then, because the land was inexpensive, the artist, and I should say for my only white artist, and started buying up places to live. So there, there was a real fear of gentrification. And it's become, I mean, some people in the black community say it doesn't matter if it's redeveloped, everyone moves up, but a lot of people have it move out. So this has become a real issue, and mm -hmm. I've seen that happen. But mm -hmm. yet, there needed to be redevelopment. There needed to be banks that were willing to give loans. They still don't have a grocery store because the grocery stores have been in and then they leave because there's been a lot of um, crimes, stealing and loitering. So, I mean, it's a difficult situation. St. Peter's worked very hard, and um, they've gotten good city council people from that area, but it's very challenging to do the redevelopment, get the investment, because people who invest want a return, right. and not have gentrification, and it takes a lot of work to do that. I think it's necessary, and I think in the end, it's probably going to be a really good thing, but it's difficult. So I think Dory's right to worry about the gentrification, which tends to mean that if it's uh, an area of underserved and that, you know, young, well, white people who <laughs> move in. Well, you could add some words at the end of Action 11. That preserves the neighborhood character or something yeah, like that. There you go. Protects and preserves Very the good. neighborhood character. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's good. Yes. I think it's the 
that private could be investment a part that is frightening. What? I said it's the private investment part right. that is frightening because anytime there's private investment, there needs to be uh, it needs to be compensated, you know, and then the rents go up. But um, I think that that's an excellent addition to that. I mean, you have I, otherwise who invests the city? Well, the city's probably not going to do it, so it has to be private. But maybe with that caveat that could that could work mm -hmm. and as long as the people who live in these areas are part of the conversation and solution and that is something that St. Pete really tr has tried to do right. and that's really helped okay so that preserves the I heard the word protects. Preserves it. and protects. Yeah. Paul, don't we have in planning, we have um, a, an ordinance in place to where the neighborhoods, in other words, there's some uh, anomalies, we'll call them around town, where you have like, s like single level, you know, homes, and all of a sudden a giant mansion will go in and then mm -hmm. changes the drainage pattern and it changes how people get light in their yards and all types of things. And I think when Renee was here before, she put an ordinance in place, or there was an ordinance put in place that said that that protects the character of neighborhoods, that kind of stops that from people coming in and changing everything, especially along um, Whitcomb Bayou, where there's all the, you still have the vista, you still have those low-level homes, so that there's not really a danger of all those houses being torn down and putting up giant, you know, homes everywhere. I'm pretty sure there's something like that in place, but I wonder if that if that ordinance would somehow apply to this as well that keeps the character of the neighborhood. I don't want to be redundant in what we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So I modified action 11 and there's a to-do to check to see what kind of ordinance we have. All right, moving on, public park land. So um, outcome one about the acreage um, received four votes. So that's in, and then for local actions, there are quite a few. Um, how, how would we define the population density of Tarpon Springs in those four categories? Would we be intermediate low, intermediate high? Is there a is there a, a mm. glossary somewhere for these terms that <laughs> that Star uses? Mm. There, um, I was wondering that. Who? Who was it? Somebody came and spoke to us, and I can't, I'm racking my brain right now, I can, and I can't remember. Um, this information is out there. I just wasn't able to pull it back up. Somebody was discussing um, community. Pat, Pat McNeese came from the Correct. planning department. Mm -hmm. And I think somewhere within her um, conversation with us, this information was out there, like um, Population whether they were community density. parks versus city parks mm -hmm. versus county parks and the population that lived within. Um, so I, I don't mind running back and trying to find that information. I just um, didn't at that time. Be interesting I, I looked it up today. Mm -hmm. So oh, okay. there's a distinction. I think what she was presenting was um, green space right. versus park. park. And, and there is a distinction. Like what, parks what is like, is that? well, like soccer fields, baseball versus like green space is just an open area in a neighborhood. Like active recreation versus passive, mm -hmm. okay. a passive park. That was what I was seeing the distinction as. Okay, I, I just I recall only only because um, they did this um, while we were all in quarantine. Go find all these parks in Tarpon Springs. Yeah, and um, there were way more parks in Tarpon Springs than I was aware of. Right, um, you know, and right. so um, it that led me to kind of go back to that um, parkland. Right, mm -hmm. and the number of people around the, uh, in the community, those residents, 
the and the definite the distinction between the community parks versus the city park versus the county parks. Mm -hmm. So ver as opposed to green space. So I mm -hmm. I thought she had a distinction between the parkland. But I could be very wrong. And going back to Dr. Dr. Robinson's question was you wanted to know what the definition is for high uh, population density Correct. like is there a number on it? Yeah. And I think it's as a relative term otherwise I think they would have defined it. I I would say it's interesting what what the trend is here. Um, as you go to lower population, more rural you areas, more, you, you need, need more, more acreage, land. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Um, opposite of what I would have thought. But <laughs> I, I know that I've heard it said, right, that Pinellas County is the most densely populated yes. county in the state. Yes. So I think that um, we'd probably be in the high category. Yes. Um, and we can use start with that benchmark and just see where that puts us. Terms of or would it just be land? Tarpon Springs itself, you know, being at our, our population density hmm. versus the county population hmm. density? Well, let's see what more I can find out about that. I'll talk to P&Z. Yeah, because, uh, you know, to me, parkland means, like, you can go recreate there, but, like, the, the city dump where the, no, it's not the dump, but whatever the landfill, the landfill, like to me, that's not, <laughs> right. that is not recreation and should not be considered in those numbers at all. Might be someday. <laughs> Might be. <laughs> true. True, true. I remember like on Chesapeake where I live, there's a little what I call a park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember when, I can't remember her name when she was here, she didn't have that on the map. Oh, Pat McNeese? Yeah, she said, you know. This is it. It was well, from the park. February but it's, 18th. It's the neighborhood meeting. It needs a lot of work. It's always overgrown and a mess. But um, yeah, she, she but I like gave it. us open space facilities. Mm -hmm which I don't know is necessarily the same thing as parks. Hmm. Well, in action number one, it's adopt a parks and or open space plan. Mm -hmm. We might want to eliminate open space plan, <laughs> just <laughs> use parks. Okay, so for the local actions, it is local action one, like you mentioned, adopt parks and or open space plan that promotes community-wide network of public spaces that provides recreational and transportation benefits while protecting natural, historic, and cultural resources. Action two, well, I'm sorry, not two, two. Uh, not two. In terms of Go back Craig to Park, theater. what recreational at Craig Park? Yeah. Well, There's tennis facilities there? Oh, I guess that's true. You can launch a boat. Boat launch. A boat. Okay. Oh, shuffleboard. Don't forget the shuffleboard. Don't forget, shuffleboard. Don't forget the, the shuffleboard. Angry, angry, it's going to be, a, it'll shuffleboard? come back. Shuffleboard is coming back. It's 3 a.m. is oh. when that's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so still excited. alive and well in St. Pete. I used to be on and a <laughs> shuffleboard team and, in St. Pete. And you that can go to good. the rec center and get all the equipment you need to play shuffleboard there. Yeah, but I don't <laughs> think so. Ford's probably very good. Well, so we're well, at 730. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to rein in the side <laughs> conversations. <laughs> Got it. Um, so action three is um, adopt regulatory strategies or development incentives to create, maintain, and connect public parkland. Uh, four, adopt site sign guidelines for new public parklands and improvements to existing facilities to strengthen environmental benefits and provide visitor amenities. Action five, participate in a local or regional alliance working to improve and expand the community-wide or regional park system. Action seven, host or partner with a volunteer program to support public parkland maintenance. Hmm. I like that. Nine, uh, host programs and events in public parkland that bring the community together and encourage physical activity. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then 10, uh, consistently invest sufficient capital and operational funding to create and maintain parklands. 
Is there a big part of the budget that does that already? Which the uh, sufficient capital to yeah. create and maintain parklands. There is a recreation impact fund. Mm -hmm. There's also the penny fund, which has been used yeah. for things, and the general fund. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, yes, so there is funding sources for this. All right, and then our last section, transportation choices. There were no outcomes. Um, there were a bunch of local actions. So the first is adopt a bicycle and or pedestrian master plan that prioritizes future projects to improve safety and access to non-motorized transportation and connects to public transit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Action two, adopt a complete streets policy that addresses all users, applies to all projects with limited exceptions and includes specific next steps for implementation. Action three, subdivision and other development regulations require walkability standards that encourage walking and enhance safety. Mm -hmm. uh, action eight, increase the mileage of sidewalks, particularly on arterial or collector roads that connect people with destinations. Action nine, increase the mileage of striped or buffered bicycle lanes, cycle tracks, parallel off street paths and or mm -hmm. other dedicated facilities. Action 10, establish or support a community-wide public bike share program. Hmm. And then action 11, construct or retrofit transportation infrastructure to meet standards in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. So any other discussion about built environments? All right. Moving on to our next item, which is a presentation about Whitcomb Bayou. Paul, you have the floor. You want me to go up there, Ashley? That's up to you. If you want to say next slide, I can do that too. As he's moving over there, Dory, I'd like to ask um, for a meeting. Um, yes, sir. If we could look at the agenda after this item to get to the discussion on the sustainability job description. I'm just not so sure we're going to get too much yeah. farther past this one. So I just want you to think about that. If we could possibly accomplish the feedback at this meeting, it would be sorry, helpful what? to the city manager. Sure. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because it's review for most of you. Um, this is in material that Dr. Karen Bolter and I presented to this committee last November, I believe. And then we presented again to the Board of Commissioners about six weeks ago. Um, the board has talked about putting a boardwalk or a walkway or a parkway along the, here, along the uh, I don't think it works. east shore of Whitcomb Bayou. And here's Whitcomb Bayou here. There's the east shore. There's South Spring Boulevard. Craig Park, just for orientation, is this is working part of the time. It doesn't. Uh, you have to point it at the computer, I think. I'm sorry? You have to point it at the computer. Point it at the computer? Is that oh, gonna use work? the pointer oh. on the computer. Oh. Yeah, the, the TV soaks up the laser beam. Oh, is that what he's trying to do? Is do the laser beam? Yeah, he's oh. trying to yeah, do the wall does Oh, no, I'm sorry. We I, got, I think we've got orientation. So. We're going to we're going to sure look is. at we're going to look at Whitcomb Bayou because there are issues w with Whitcomb Bayou that we believe need to be fixed before we put in a parkway or a walkway on top of the riprap there. And this mm -hmm. is what we talked with the board about. Um, much of the shore along Whitcomb Bayou is at or below three three feet above sea level. Ooh. So this is an issue. Um, this is flooding from October 15th, a couple years ago, mm. not because of a storm, just because of high tide. And as it turns out, it wasn't the high tide that month, which occurred nine days earlier. Mm. This is just high tide flooding. And as you know, we're anticipating a good deal more of that. Mm -hmm. This is the low point along that street, but it really doesn't matter because the, the land is three feet or below. Um, erosion, now we're looking at the south shore. Erosion here and, and the water is sometimes in the road, not unusually, just because of high tide. Mm -hmm. This is now we're looking at the west shore and you can see that these old palm trees, whoops, how'd I do that? 
hair, okay. These old palm trees are leaning mm -hmm. into the bayou, and they will be lost mm -hmm. because they're being undermined on the water side. Mm -hmm. uh, another view of that. This is, again, the West Shore. Okay. There are two m most common ways in which um, municipalities, et cetera, deal with flooding and deal with erosion. The most common by far in the United States is the bulkhead, the one all the way mm. to the right. There it is. Um, but those break down over time. The most common green uh, creation is this breakwater of usually oyster shells in bags, sometimes granite boulders in the water. And then you can see the vegetation in, in there in green. There are disadvantages to bulkheads. They reflect wave energy. Right. And when they do that, they erode mm -hmm. the bottom of the, uh, of the waterway. Um, they don't absorb wave energy at all. In contrast, green infrastructure, in this case, we're talking about a liver, living shoreline, mm -hmm. absorbs 50%, sometimes more, of wave energy. They also, if you're using oyster shells or other um, these, these are not, these are, they're bags of old oyster shells, but they tend to recolonize. And the colonies that, that uh, find territories and niches in there filter the water and clean the water. Uh, the other interesting thing is that um, living shorelines like this, composed of vegetation plus bivalves and other organisms, absorb carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. They absorb more carbon dioxide than, than freshwater marsh. Mm -hmm. They absorb more carbon dioxide than a comparable acre of um, forest mm -hmm. or even rainforest. Mm -hmm. In fact, one square mile, as it shows there on the, on the left-hand side, of salt marsh soars the equivalent of 76,000 gallons of gasoline, and they do it every year. Mm -hmm. So if we could if we can use living shorelines as our solution, even if we have to raise the berm of the bayou's shores, we will accomplish many things that you cannot accomplish with a bulkhead. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting how that works. Okay. Ah, okay. This is a typical living shoreline. This, these happen to be bags of oyster shells. Hmm. Um, and the water has to get in to nourish your, your plants. What are the bags made out of? I'm sorry? What are the bags that hold the oyster shells made out of? Good question. Um, they're, t they're typically made out of nylon, but they can be made out of absorbable material, too. It, plastic, like nylon? They can be made out of nylon. They can be made out of burlap, uh, which, of course, breaks down, but hopefully right. they'll colonize before they break down. I see. Okay. So the idea is that eventually the bags break down and they... Colonize this. Right. Oh, okay. I didn't understand that. This Thank is you. this is smooth cord grass, which um, increases in thickness and density over time. It also accretes soil mm -hmm. and detritus, and so it raises naturally over time against gravity. Mm -hmm. This is just you know. There's more than one way to skin this cat. You could use just vegetation on the left. You could use um, oyster shells or some other uh, semi-natural with cord grass, or you can use granite. Interestingly enough, because um, there are granite riprap boulders along that shore, mm. which could be moved offshore into the water and used as your breakwater. This is just another version of, of a living shoreline that has the um, granite plus cord grass. So living shorelines probably won't work in Craig Park, <laughs> probably won't work in Spring Bayou. It's too narrow and probably not aesthetically pleasing. But there's another solution. This is something that was shown to this committee by the sustainability coordinator from Sarasota. And these man-made concrete structures can be attached to seawalls, man-made seawalls, below the waterline. And over time, they in turn colonize and ultimately you uh, clean the water. 
with the bivalves that colonize, and the other organisms that colonize. This is uh, Volvo Corporation's approach to a living seawall, um, commercial structures. The biggest installation of these is in the port of Sydney, Australia. Mm. It'll be interesting over time to see the difference in water quality uh, as this uh, takes hold. Mm. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission in Florida is developing a living shorelines course for contractors. Mm. Um, that was the end of my part of the presentation. And then Karen Bolter, who is a senior planner, um, has a degree in, uh, um, it's, well, it's, it's not climate science, but it's something al analogous to climate science from Florida Atlantic University. Gave a presentation on a BRIC grant program, which stands for Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. FEMA has realized that the, when they get into the endless loop of disaster impacts and rebuilding, all they're doing is throwing good money after bad. So the BRIC program is an approach in which it, you insert preventative measures in the form of grants that municipalities, counties, et cetera, can apply for and stop the cycle of disaster impact rebuild. Um, FEMA has calculated that every dollar that is spent in prevention using one of these grants saves six dollars in rebuilding costs. Mm -hmm. Last year, 2020, was the first year of the BRIC program and there was 500 million dollars in the entire grant program. Mm. Um, a municipality like Tarpon Springs could apply for up to $50 million per grant. Mm. There would have to be a 25% match, but that 25% match can take a lot of different forms. It could, for example, be a state grant. It could be, for example, contribution of professional services. They're very lenient about what they allow the matching money to be. This year, because last year was such a disaster or a concatenation of disasters, the amount in the BRIC program is one billion with a B dollars this year, and it's wow. expected to go up. Plus, the Biden administration has kicked an additional 3.5 billion into the mix, which will be not in BRIC, but will be in other grant programs. Well, okay. Um, Arcadis, was, which is the, the corporation based in the Netherlands, but they have a strong presence in, in the United States, and it's particularly in Florida, has a pretty good track record in getting federal money like this, $5 billion for their clients in the last seven years. Um, I presented this information to the Board of Commissioners, as I said, but subsequently presented it to uh, Commissioner Dave Eggers, who is the chair of the county commission. He liked it, referred me on to Hank Hottie, whom I mentioned before, who is the resilience officer for um, the county. And, you know, he said, um, among other things, brick is probably something that is that would be more difficult to get than a community development block grant mitigation grant. We should definitely put together a group of people, including Paul Smith, uh, and go after at least a CDBG um, mitigation grant. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I think we should do both. Mm -hmm. We have the offer of Arcadis' help. I don't think we should look that gift horse in the mouth, my opinion, okay? Um, okay, I'm gonna stop at that point. If I could add, because this is very timely, I, I, I thank you, Dr. Robinson, for this because it's working very well with what the Board of Commissioners asked for. If I could just take a quick minute and read to the group the motion from the Board, I think it might help frame all this for you because they're asking for your input too. Um, this is a draft memo we're putting together. We're looking to put this in front of the Board on August 24th to um, because they asked us to come back with a plan so this is very draft but the summary was at the june 8th uh, regular session the board of commissioners 
the BOC considered and discussed options and alternatives to address the subject area of Whitcomb Boulevard. Specifically, the commission was interested in, um, at that time, pedestrian and aesthetics of the revetment area. But after much discussion and input from the Sustainability Committee and from the general public, the BOC ultimately decided to consider broader measures including flooding and sea level rise in the subject area. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. um, as a result, the Board of Commissioners asked city staff to analyze alternatives, delivery methods, and funding opportunities for a comprehensive approach to addressing the area. Staff was directed to work with Turn the Tide for Tarpon and the City Sustainability Committee for input as well. So I'm hoping to accomplish that second part tonight. Still figuring out how I need to do the Turn the Tide input, but um, maybe you can help me figure it out. Well, maybe it's a two-for-one deal here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got a draft. We've been working with Arcadis through our consultant to come up with a scope. And uh, I just want to read an outline of basically what it involves and just, if I could, ask for your all's input. And then when we present to the board, we can say this is what the committee suggests. So one of the ideas on the table is to hire Arcadis through Cardno, who's our engineer of record, so it would sub them basically for ten to fifteen thousand dollars to prepare a grant application to seek planning funds. So this idea would be to go for a planning project first, complete the planning phase, which could include public involvement, and um, come up with the various alternatives. Then do the design using grant funding. You know, you'd use this to to apply for the construction grant basically and then competitively bid the project and hire a contractor to complete the construction so that's one approach is to do an initial um, grant application for planning do the planning get the public involvement and then form a grant to do the construction from that the other idea is to go right into um, hiring Arcadis through Cardno again for about 40,000 to prepare technical feasibility and alternatives analysis, basically building that planning step right in. I think this approach would get you to a construction grant more quickly, um, but it may not be as much time in the planning phase, which is good and bad. I mean, I think you do want to take some appropriate time for public input. You don't want to rush that part, because when that goes wrong, Oof. the project won't go forward. Um, so anyway, and then Arcadis would then prevent, prepare a grant application to seek the uh, million dollar, multi-million dollar award for engineering construction after the alternatives have been developed and reviewed and uh, public input on those and that sort of thing. So I'll turn it back over with those ideas. So it sounds like there's two options. One is $15,000 expenditure to do kind of a uh, planning phase and then seek construction grant or a $40,000 technical feasibility study that's more technical exactly what would happen with the construction. Would it make it more likely that we get the funding if we have that more technical aspect worked out? You know, that part really wasn't addressed. I think mm -hmm. that's a great question. and. And at any point, Dr. Robinson, if you've got something to add, because you've been working on this much more closely than I have, the difference between the two that I see is the first option might take longer okay. you know, by a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But it might be more thorough on the planning side. Option two, if we're looking to get more rapid results, would probably, like I said, shave maybe a year or two off and um, get right to that construction part in the grant more quickly. This company has a lot of experience though and given what I know about uh, subcontractors who have worked for the city and um, different projects that were a major letdown and a, ma and a lot more expensive than they were anticipated I would my my vote would be to go with the the experts that have dealt with this type of um, challenge already and they know what they're doing okay rather than to um, 
go with whoever bids the least amount and then find out that they completely failed the um, project and we spend a lot of money that's wasted? Yeah, I might not have described it well. Actually, either one of those options includes Arcadis. It does. Okay, not. I, was I thought it did. Yeah, they yeah. both do. So, but uh, the point's well taken that your your vote of confidence is towards the expertise of this mm -hmm. company being involved. Right. My m my thing would go to the second option, um, and I don't know why one couldn't build in planning into that because um, you'd have to have some planning to do the technical thing and so I say the second one because we'll get it done quickly and as everything in every study every announcement is we don't have time to waste the time is now so the, if we can do the second op option and get things done a little more quickly, and I assume as thoroughly, I would go to the second one. I'm going to throw in that FEMA is looking for partners along the coasts of the United States. They're looking for partners that they can, f that they can form professional relationships with now, that they can you know, look toward improvements in the future. And so the sooner we get to the grant, I think the better off we may be in the long run. Hmm. So would you say option one or two? I think two. Yeah, mm -hmm. me too. Very quickly, a uh, motion to extend the meeting. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Was that Karen? Thank you. Was it? Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts? I mean, I, I it sounds like consensus is to go with option two. Yes, I, I agree. And Paul, I have a question for you. Arcadis, it, they they work with residents. I mean, they would be including the community partners in this as well, correct? If that's desired, they'll do it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that might be if if there's a, a hesitancy about not having community input, maybe build that into this part two. But I agree that that it's t very timely. I agree that FEMA. If they're looking for partners, we could step up and be a wonderful partner on an ongoing basis and build that relationship. Um, yeah, I think that two, what, two years for a planning grant is just mm -hmm. too, too long. Mm -hmm. And then get into another thing. So $15,000 versus $40,000 to move things along more quickly. So I, might, my, mm -hmm. I would like option two as well. Paul, do you agree with that thinking? Well, no, I, I hear you, and I, that's fine with me. I, um, I appreciate you all having a consensus and giving us some direction that we can forward on. I will say one thing that I'd, I will just have to wait and see, but something I think that we might see with this project is it, it has to be substantial enough. Uh, Dr. Robinson, when he introduced this, said that FEMA's interested in projects that are going to make a difference in terms of avoiding damage that they have to pay for. So that means... This is going to change the way that looks from the houses around there, from the road. I really think this public involvement part is going to be major. I and do too. I mm -hmm. think I'm going to go a little further and say I think some of the public might be a little surprised at what the result really will look like. It isn't just beautifying the shoreline. Right. It's going to be like you might not be able to see parts of the right. water depending right. on where you stand. And um, we just all, it needs to happen. Yeah. But um, we got to make sure we bring the property owners along with us. And uh, is there so? Because there is there a way to hybridize that to where there's a planning component of this built into this? Yeah, yeah that's what you Absolutely. mentioned. Yeah. Yes, that can. Yeah. There's going to have to be community support for this. I mean, yeah. good God, just look at Facebook about the sign at the sponge docks. <laughs> right. We're talking. Yeah. Well, I think there needs to be extensive education to the community yeah. because if you think. Um, just think along Whitcomb where when the sidewalk was being put in yeah. mm -hmm. and it's like now people are looking I mean the sidewalk for me because I don't live in one of those homes meant it was a contiguous sidewalk on a street that's kind of dangerous if you're yes. if you're walking right so you know not being directly involved but the people who did live along that street had a lot to say about that mm -hmm. sidewalk yeah. coming in yeah. right. and I think there needs to be a lot of education as to why this is because I, I think people look at that and say 
I, I won't be able to see the bayou or I won't, yeah. you know, whatever, what have you. And it's, well, you're not going to be able to see the bayou when the water's in your home either. Mm, right. right. And so I think that needs to be, you know, I mean, that's being very, very blunt about it, but it, it, it the education mm -hmm. component is very big before the, so people understand. That's a very good point. My You'll be able to see the water all too well. Well, yeah. uh, you'll be in the water. around <laughs> it. Um, my, my question. Um, but some people just don't believe that still. I, and, I and, mean, and they I just agree. don't believe that. And I, and, and I do understand that. And uh, But that's why I think there's an education 100%. component and how it's approached is important. My um, question, maybe I'm making this very, very simplistic, and, and I don't. maybe I don't understand this. The 40000 um, one that includes the, tech, the technical feasibility study, that $15,000 option does not include that because I think we need to know if what are options, what feasible options are out there because some of the things that Dr. Robinson was presenting are fabulous. And if that's not feasible and appropriate here, but we've got all this planning going mm -hmm. on, then I don't think we've done our due diligence. So does that 15000 include any kind of feasibility studies? Yeah, um, going back, option one you're talking about, ten to fifteen thousand to prepare the grant application to seek the planning funds. Mm -hmm. That's what that was. Planning funds. Yes, and then the funds would be about three hundred thousand to complete that planning phase if we got the grant. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, um, I have a question about Arcadis and working with FEMA. So if we're looking to form a long-term partnership with FEMA or to be one of those coastal sites that they're interested in continually working with. Could Arcadis give us a future vision of here's here's the Whitcomb project, but where else in the city we could do this? How could we make this interesting to FEMA or make this? Uh, it, I think obviously it would be very logical for them to do that. Good. Um, Whitcomb should be the, the first um, the first swing. It's, I mean, the problems of flooding and erosion are not unique to Whitcomb Bayou. Sure. Um, and the only reason w we turned the tide and others began looking at them was because the, the BOC began talking about a, a legacy walkway mm -hmm. from Craig Park, possibly, you know, around around the, uh, the bayou, but possibly all the way to Sunset. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. And, and that would be lovely. It's just we have to fix the flooding right. first. Right, right. And we also do have, right, a, a project to look at vulnerability assessment for the whole city. So that's right. part of this is going to be going in parallel, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I think that that becomes my question. So I live on a bayou, and, um, you know, we have riffraff, and we have mangroves, so we have a sort of, and we have oysters. So um, my question is, so you're, you know, I can hear the date. So... Why is Wicked Bayou getting it? You know, Kramer Bayou, we flood too, so why aren't we having it? So one of the questions would be from how could what's being learned here be, uh, be communicated to other? So I could, you know, build up my shore better if I were provided with information and communication from mm. what's being developed there. So how do I get oysters to, I mean, I think our oysters are already growing, um, but how could I do that? And, um, and I would think FEMA would like that because, you know, we all have to have flood insurance and so on. So, and so in a way that the rest of the community feels like they're not being um, you know, not getting attention. And, and so the, we can all be educated and then it could be phase two or three. Mm -hmm. I think that becomes a, a different, different beast because you're looking at community, public roads and what have you versus private homes that are being affected on right. on Creamer Bayou. I think that, you know, certain sections of it anyway. Right. So I think that's what I, you know, this this needs to be the main. I understand where you're coming from, and I, I think that just becomes a different educational uh, component, maybe. Yeah. I but think of this as demonstration this. project. This mm -hmm. is like mm -hmm. the first one, and then there'll mm -hmm. be tremendous learning from this that right. could be applied to. And other. that's how you address that: is you say, "Well, you don't want to be the first one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you want them to practice on somebody right. else. Right. Right. And then right. you do it. Then you, you do it. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe a way that you know individual 
homes because the the bayou is shared um, can be um, influenced by this mm -hmm. while it's going on. Um, this is great. I really like that. Thank you, Paul. Yes, thank you, Paul. A um, couple questions. Who gets information on repetitive loss properties? Does it come to um, the city manager? Does it come to one of the departments? Does the, the field uh, specialist of, for the city get I, where, Who gets that information? Yeah, repetitive I'm, loss that's properties? not ringing a bell at all. I would think that would be from private property owner to insurance company. What's repetitive What's repetitive what is, what What's does that, that mean? mean? These are properties that flood repeatedly oh. and require insurance mm -hmm. and government money mm. to bring them back up to snuff. And they, we what must have them. Chronic flooding is 26 times a year. There was a stat that I had read in something that we were sent that <laughs> said that that is a chronic flood hmm. zone is when it floods 26 times a year. Hmm. The other thing that people don't know is that FEMA is going to come out with recommendations on insurance for places like uh, some of the homes and, and businesses along Tarpon, which is going to shock mm. everybody how much more things are going to cost. Mm. That's coming. It hasn't, it hasn't been released yet. Mean for flood insurance. But it is coming. Well, back to the bigger waters issue that's that your, they were. That's in your bailiwick. That's, yep, yeah, when yeah. They, were, they were discussing the bigger wa waters and no longer subsidizing your flood insurance, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people started to panic mm -hmm. because, you know, your flood insurance might have been fifteen hundred dollars goes up to fifteen thousand dollars or right. what have you, and I think that, you know, that's when they started talking about not rebuilding homes down in the Keys and what have you, and just not issuing permits to people homeowners because they were repetitive. Mm -hmm. ones. But I, I agree with Paul. I don't think though that that's public information. Yeah. I'll follow. Up. I, I don't know. I if don't it know would be anyone, it'd be our building department because they manage the flood. Mm -hmm. rate map program, you know, that whole thing. I'm probably not calling it the right thing, but yeah. Is, so there, is there any downside to the 40,000 um, feasibility study, technical and feasibility study that, that you see? I, I would just say it may not a, afford as much time for a thorough, as long public input process, but I think we can address that. I think we can live with that. Yeah. yeah. Is 40, there is a risk enough? of waiting a long time too with grant funding. I mean, if it dries mm -hmm. up, Gone. different True. administration, yeah. you know, exactly. could change. I think as, as as long as legally there is the correct amount of time between you know whether it's readings and and public input, and as long as you put it out there, I don't I don't see a, a downside to doing it in that time frame. It just means that the community needs to be aware and get their input in mm -hmm. sooner. You know, as long as, like I said, we follow the, the legal guidelines to... Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Us. Bolter mentioned there's flexibility with FEMA in terms of how long you take to finish the project. So if we need to slow it down to finish up the public um, engagement part to get, get it where it needs to be, you know, I think there'd be an ability to do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so do you feel you've I got do. our Thank direction and our questions maybe to get answered? Or if I could just ask, um, does thought? Turn the Tide also concur with option two? <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you. That, that makes it easy. Does. All 120 <laughs> of us agree. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, so do you want to switch it up then to input for the sustainability position? Yes, please. And this can be as short as you all want it to be, um, but the city manager did want to hear back from you. You know, there was, um, I put in your backup, you wanted me to get this back to you, that markup that also went to the board. Um, and I think the budget advisory committee also weighed in at the board's request. Um, they felt it should be a coordinator position. One of the things that we research is what does the area have, and it's all coordinators in our area. So. Um, I think that resonated with the Budget Advisory Committee. I will say they recommended a pay grade 17. The city manager is looking at something even a little bit higher than that recommendation. Um, 17,000? No, it's, that's a, I'm sorry. That number probably won't mean anything to anybody, but it's just where the grades are numbered. Oh, I see. Like 4 through 27 or something. I see. 
So um, the markup is in your backup. It's the red uh, lines. Hopefully everybody got a chance to see that. Did it happen? Yes. It sent on the 6th of August. Yep. And there was also a little email cover that I'll read that part to you. Is it from you, Ashley? Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah. Yes, it was sent on the 6th. Okay. So let me read this. It's just a paragraph. City manager asked that I brief the committee on the board's consensus on the sustainability position and to request any follow-up input on the final draft of the job description. In summary, at the July 29th budget workshop, the board provided consensus to move forward with a sustainability coordinator position for the fiscal year 22 budget, consistent with the budget advisory committee recommendation. The city manager has prepared a final draft markup that's the red font in the markups of the job description based on the most recent committee comments. That's what, that was his starting point. And um, he wanted to have any further thoughts that with the hope that we can move forward together. I know the, the committee wanted it at a director level. Um, I think there's been some compromise here to accomplish basically almost all of the comments that you all made were maintained. Really the main difference is just what the title is and who it reports to. Um, the Board of Commissioners wanted it to be in the Public Services Department. Mm. So that's the way we've put it here. Um, well, I'll just turn is that it back. your department? Yes, that's, that's uh, so Ashley So the person nice would report to you? They would. It's probably a good move. I think we could have some continuity for sure. You know, I could help bring this position up to speed, stay involved. And um, also, if all goes well, the assistant director position, I think, is in line to be approved as well. So just more resources that we can put on this. I mean, you saw the talent with Tommy earlier. I mean, yeah. uh, someone like that yeah. involved. Very good. And that person would have some autonomy and would only report to you? They would report to me, but you know, as the city manager said, it's gonna have his full support. Um, he mentioned in the board meeting his feeling with community policing, he used that as an example. He had a great success with having a position, but also having that working with all of the departments, mm -hmm. you know, integrated into all the programs. And he sees that same thing here. So with this approach, you all, your recommendations have someone focus on it full time. That's what you'd have here. But it would be working, you know, within a department, but also coordinating with other departments with the full support of the city manager. So I think it really is a good combination. But um, if there's any comments on the edits, um, be happy to bring them back. Uh, um, right up from where it says essential functions, that paragraph, the underlying paragraph between the strikeout and the bottom of that paragraph. Mm -hmm. It says, um, establishes and fosters collaboration, blah, blah. Let's see, what am I looking at? The first sentence, incumbent implements and updates the sustainability action plan by setting targets and objectives. Targets and objectives. Well, shouldn't it be goals and objectives or objectives, to, aren't targets objectives and goals? Or I mean, isn't that mm -hmm. the same thing? Or yeah, I was trying to find where you're reading there. See where right here. Essential functions. Is it a number? Right here, incumbent. Oh. Yeah, right, right there. Oh, I see. Okay. It's just a, it's just a word, it's but target. it says targets and objectives. It's on the next line after. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, so this was part of <laughs> the underline is what you all added. Yes. <laughs> well. So you want to change what you changed? Sure. Okay. But if that, I mean, if y'all aren't targets and objectives the same thing, or goals and objectives? Kind of, sort of, essentially. Anyway. Uh, yeah, well, can you just okay. setting goals? Yeah, setting that focus goals. on the setting city's goals. triple bottom line of setting goals. Setting I don't like the word targets. 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 We don't need targets. So I, don't need I think targets. that the reason that I had 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 targets and objectives instead of goals is because we're the like the sustainability committee was setting the goals, and then they're kind of like implementing it. But if you guys want to have them setting the goals, then that's fine too. I mean. Hmm. Well, it says it's going to implement and update the sustainability action plan um, by setting. So it is giving this person um, 
permission to take what we give them yeah. and set her own objectives and goals or to modify ours. So we could just delete that middle part out and just say incumbent implements and updates the sustainability action plan. Yes. That focuses on the city's triple bottom line. Yes, I like because they'll have to set goals and uh, objectives. By, by and focusing on. Yeah, good idea. By focusing on the city's mm -hmm. triple, I agree. You know, it's an awful lot of things to ask one person to do. You're right. Isn't it, it is. It's I huge. mean, who it can is. do all of this? Well, you, that, that's exactly daunting. what we thought, and that's why. It's a great segue. You'll see in here some of the things we added back in is and works with city staff and others, you know, to do these sorts of things because I don't think we can expect one person right. to know it all or do it all because you've got so many elements in this planning elements, engineering elements. So I think we're we're not wanting to scare off a candidate by them going gulp. Yeah. I got to figure all this out, <laughs> you know. No, you're going to have help. You're going to be working with other stakeholders. The person is the head of a sort of department in a way and has people she needs to um, ask for assistance and to delegate. I see what you did Dory, there. Dory, are you looking funny? Well, they, they wouldn't be the head of a department with the way that this is being structured. Right. They're the coordinator. But they're a head of a... They're he ahead of something, aren't they? They're working with Paul. They're coordinating with others. And I, I think that's the appeal of it from our perspective. Instead of someone coming in and telling a department how to do it, yeah. they're working within each department's expertise to make it all come together. That's the difference. But they're the leader, aren't they? They're Why the coordinator. They're kind of like the link between everything else. Yes. Love work. Why isn't this working? I'm plugged. Can I ask a question f with number four? Why um, the Green Fleet plan to oh, reduce greenhouse go. gas emissions was struck out? Yeah, the thought there was huh? we didn't want to presume yet like what we're going to be calling that plan, if it's going to be a Green Fleet plan, but it is going to be an action plan to reduce the emissions from the Green Fleet. So it just seemed a little too prescriptive this early in the process. So could we move it down to 32 where it's got the A, B, C, D, E? Because those are pretty prescriptive as well. I lost my page orders. Okay. Yeah, so the comment on 32, the purpose of that was the same as earlier where w originally it looked like we were asking this one person to identify historic structures and preservation and develop a preservation plan and all of these things that that's a expertise that mm -hmm. I don't think the average sustainability person is going to have. So we reworded that to say works within the framework with city staff and other stakeholders to do these things. Including areas of which is more inclusive too. But this is what I don't understand. So suppose I'm the coordinator. And I say, okay, I need to identify historic structures. I decide that I'm going to, do I have the power then to go to somebody and say, I want you to do this? I don't think so. No. No. Then how do I get it done? You go I have to go to Paul, and then Paul has to go and ask that person? No, you go to the person, yeah. and you say, I need some help with this. We got to get this done. The they person works the with you. If they don't work with you, you come to Paul and he helps make sure they work with you. And if that doesn't work, the city manager will be getting with them. To or get you it done. ask Paul who you should right, go talk to. Right, but still, that means I would have to be working on this while I'm working on 8,000 other things. So I can't delegate to a person and say, I want you to do this study. I'm the one that still has to be doing that? No, you're the okay. one making sure that that other department's working on that and okay. getting that for you. And if they're not, then you report it to me and we'll make it happen. But we're really going to work on a culture of teamwork yeah. here, and I don't think okay. it's going to be impossible. It's like the planning department knows historic structures. The historical so society knows historic structures. You know, So mm -hmm. you could work with several people to figure out what you need to accomplish. Okay. 
I just want to make sure that this person has enough power to get it done and feel as though they're um, independent in some way, even though they report to you. Like this man, he, he reports to you, mm -hmm. correct? That's right. But he has independence to sort of do what he hasn't, doesn't have to check out everything he does with you, does he? No, and uh, he's not a director either, and that's a great example. Um, Ashley and him were able to get all this information. I really didn't have to get involved. I mean, when the organization is working together, and that's the city manager's role, is to set the tone up front and say, you know, this stuff's got to happen. Yep. Um, yeah. I see what you're saying, though, with the whole, like, you kind of want it to be prescriptive and they're, like, explicitly stated, like, they can. Because assuming, like, it's assuming that everyone's on board and everyone's doing teamwork, but it's not kind of, I don't know. I, I see what you're, where you're going with that, though. Maybe say that we, the position would serve, like, under this board or something. I don't know exactly how to, like, also, like, we carry out what they want us to do, what we would want them to do. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I get where you're going with that. But I think the key word in this whole thing is the coordinator part, mm -hmm. where it, it, it is kind of the, it, to me, it looks like the central hub and you're coordinating the different th things underneath the different departments and, and kind of analyzing those things. And while no, I mean, I think you're doing a lot, of that, mm -hmm. a lot of that right now when it's like, you know, shoot, we can't move forward on this because we need a greenhouse gas emissions um, mm -hmm. study. I don't, you're, the coordinator would not be asked to do that, but they might work then to coordinate getting that done and looking for funding to getting those kinds of things done. Am I... Correct exactly. Incorrect. The, the word I would use is empowerment. It's going to be in my best interest. <laughs> this person is totally empowered mm -hmm. because I won't have time to go item by item and go with them over to a department and ask for something. Right. Uh, we're, we're going to set that up early and it'll That's be fine. That's what I want. Yeah. I want to know that this person's going to be empowered. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, the culture okay. of Paul will ensure that. Mm -hmm. That's what, yeah, I was. Right, I have Paul's every confidence that Paul will. I was going to say, so Paul can't leave. No, you can't. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. get it on a great path. It's going to be just fine. Yeah, and really, it's habits. I mean, I think once the departments get yeah. in a habit of this becoming part of right. everyday it's life, it's, yeah. I, I mean, if it looks overwhelming, the only thing I, I, I it does. I, I agree. Like, if I, if I read this, I'd be like, I'm not qualified for this. I'm exactly. not, you know, I'm not applying for this. And you don't want to scare people off. Are there any areas, and, you know, I was kind of going through this myself, and are there any areas that would you could use the phrase including but not limited to? Mm -hmm. And then you're kind of combining a few different mm -hmm. things. That's a good idea. And you're not making it super specific because you're saying, including these things but we're not limiting that there might be other aspects of her mm -hmm. um so i i just I, but I'm, I'm not great at combining those i didn't I, well like where it says qualifications minimum and preferred under education do something like that under experience or you know i, I don't know what the benchmark would be for how many of those things that they would because they'll also be learning as they as they do this they'll be acquiring new skills And we've got a great network in other cities that we've already established, and yes. uh, this will be part of that. And I get like number thirteen and fourteen. I don't know if there's any um, evaluates and reviews the effectiveness um, of sustainability policies, plans, programs, and initiatives. And the next one is evaluates policies, plans, programs, and initiatives generated by the city departments or the board of commissioners to determine the effect on the city's sustainability. Like, is there any? Um, Redundancy. Any redundancy? Any any way to you know? I, I'm just looking at. To me, they're two different things, yeah, though. I One is like, different. you're they're coming up with sustainability policies, and the other is, if we create this new ordinance, looking at that with the lens of sustainability. Okay. Yeah, I just to me to me I mean, and we talked about this before that we wanted to put everything in there because we needed to determine we needed to have people understand the importance mm -hmm. of the, this position and mm -hmm. why we were so adamant about that. But now, and, and it is important, 
but again, I look at that, and, and again, this is not my area of expertise. Like, this is not what I went to school for. So looking at this, I look at this, and I'm like, God, they better pay me a whole oh, lot of money. Me too. <laughs> you know, That's to what do, I Because it, it looks very overwhelming, but I don't think it has to be, mm -hmm. because it is a coordinator position. It's a coordinator, position. right, it right. Is, right. And I will say, I was part of putting this together. I took all of the job descriptions, and I wanted to make sure I didn't leave anything out. Mm -hmm. So I was pulling from Clearwater's, Dunedin's, Oldsmar's, and you know, anytime I saw something new, I'd bring it over. Right. So that's why it looks pretty long, but that way we're not leaving out things. Uh, it seems to me that a person who's a coordinator in the way that we're looking at, who's empowered to work, Having a bachelor's degree, I mean, just doesn't seem to be enough. Um, you know, someone who hasn't at least had a master's degree, who's been through a lot more, seems more appropriate to this um, position with all of these responsibilities and tasks. I mean, I think if someone who has a bachelor's degree is being maybe in their 20s and how are they going to come and have this position that is quite significant mm -hmm. and have the gravitas to get everybody together? So I would think that a, um, even though it says a minimum, I would, but it says minimum and preferred, um, I would say I would want to see someone who has a master's degree. I think you're you're going to lose out on maybe um, somebody with a bachelor's degree with a lot of experience. Right. Well, or, we could say or, that. I have a bachelor's degree. Right. And I have a lot I have of experience. Bachelor's or, degree or, as well. or the other thing you might lose out on is so somebody sorry. who I this don't have is, a master's. Yeah. This is a second career that, for. Yeah. And so okay. somebody somebody and finishes somebody. and re, and ha, maybe does not retire but retires from their first line of work or what have you and goes back and gets a degree right. in this because this is something. So I think we have to be very careful that we're going to lose. Or they have skills. Sets. They have skill sets right. in coordination. Well, they have skill sets in working okay, with it people. Says experience. I can also they say all the coordinators in the area for bachelor's degree. What? Oh, really? I'm just adding on to what you said. Oh, we're all kind of talking over each other. Yeah. Sorry, can I, can I do a, um, we have a lot of conversations going on, so nobody can hear anybody else talking. So I, I just wanted to kind of bring us back together. Can we just need to take, like, can we take a time out for a second? And yeah, preferred. time out. Having a little bit of a health crisis, I apologize. Okay. No. okay. Do you need us to call somebody for That's you? what I was. No, I think I can get home. I'm just a few blocks away. Can you walk? No. You no, get the car. No. You okay. want help down the stairs? Yeah. Can we go down the stairs yeah, with you? We can pause. Let me. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. I don't know if we need to call anybody. No, I'm. It's it's a long story. I had an appointment at a neurologist on. On Friday, but this is 35. Yeah. There you go. Um, I think I'm we're done anyway. Uh, somebody, somebody should probably drive a car back behind her. That's a great, should we end? Great idea. Should we end? <laughs> yeah, maybe somebody can drive her car and then get a ride back. We lost all our, um, what do you call? Oh, our chair people. people. Our chair people yeah. are. You want me to send somebody back up? <laughs> <laughs> who's, well, you, who's <laughs> I'll send somebody back up who is important. Yeah, yeah. I'm just and an alternate I'll, with a bachelor's degree. I, to, I, I know. Oh, do you want to go? That's my point. You want to go? Robin, do you want to go? Go with you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you think you're going to. Um, yeah, I'll go. I think somebody should drive her car and somebody else should drive behind I thought they were doing that. To get Dory back. Yeah, we need get to get Dory, Dory back. You know, my husband's down there. He could follow. Um, Paul driving her and drive Paul back. You want to go do that and get to I like back? Paul look, being look, a doctor look, look, look. with her. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah let me, because Robert's down there waiting for me. Okay, if, if he could do that, yeah. and Paul, you're right, Paul, that Paul should probably, just in case. Yeah, that was yeah. nice to have a doctor in the house. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. And nobody even said that. Is well, there he, a doctor in the house? I know. <laughs> well, maybe, <laughs> what a wasted opportunity. <laughs> maybe then we can have somebody in here to call our meeting adjourned and make that yeah. any any other because um, you're right I don't think we're in a position to do that no. now are we no. we no longer have a quorum we, we, don't, have a quorum. <laughs> we don't have a leader Paul we have a spirit of co uh, co cooperation but that's yeah. about it all right Jeez. I think we're almost done I hope God. I think we're done we are yeah.
I'm I got sorry, some I, good... I didn't realize there was a crisis going on, but it was, I didn't either. There was I don't know so who was much, talking. There was like, so much it was just a, fluff, right that... a flutter of activity. Yeah. But Dory did say something about wanting to add in the fleet after number 32 or okay. something like that. There was some, th some mention of that, so we needed to circle back with that. Yeah, let's circle back, make sure we get that in. Yeah, sorry, I just <laughs> was like, I, I can't hear what's going on here. And then you wanted to and put I was, something I was in, even... and then there's a conversation going on. And so I felt, wow, if I'd known there was some sort of medical <laughs> emergency, I would not have been. I'm glad I did, because that would have kept going on until who knows what happened. But yeah, OK. Yeah, she's got a lot of support. Yep. She'll get home safely. Yeah, I don't think she is. So. She's two blocks away. And she has a Prius that practically drives itself. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Taylor? Doing all right. Yeah? How's that job market out there? It's, uh, I saw a few things that are kind of promising. I don't want to be like a, a mosquito sprayer or anything like that. Not, yeah. There's a lot of jobs like that out there, but I want to do like, I don't know, consulting work, but you need a lot of experience. Yeah. But now I've been here for two years almost, so that's kind of helping, I feel like. Seems like an employee market right now to me. Yes. I mean, at least what I'm telling or hearing other people say, I don't know what types of jobs they're talking about, but I know we're having a hard time hiring certain things. And In the past few months, I think it's, I've seen a lot more like positions that I'd like to take. So mm -hmm. are you, plan plan you want to stay in Pinellas County? Yeah, if I could, or, you know, Hillsboro's okay. Like just around the Tampa Bay. What about like great. an assistant, a, a assistant to a sustainability coordinator, something like that? That'd be great. Um, but as I'm looking, it seems like a lot of those sustainability positions for like cities are already kind of taken because there's usually only a couple people. Mm -hmm. So uh, like what we've got like maybe 10 or so municipalities. So if each one only had one, that's only like 10 positions in the whole county. So roughly. At Beller Beach, they need a sustainability coordinator. Where? Beller Beach. Beller Beach? Bel Air Beach. Bel Air Beach. No, I'm just, don't, don't write that down. I'm just <laughs> saying that ev everybody needs one, but it's like a small municipality where you could be like a... Yeah. I've, uh, I've, it's been a while since I looked at all the... I've been just looking at LinkedIn lately. Yeah. A lot of people post it there, and then I'll go to their website and apply with them, actually. Is everything okay? No. Running, running is not good. Yeah. No. It's not normal. You have, you have a phone with This you. makes me nervous. Yeah. You know what? Dr. Robinson's with her, and they, yeah. have, phone. they have phones. Yeah, have to worry about it. You're right, but so. where? Where did Ashley go? I don't know. Fewer, fewer people in the mix right now is probably better. Well, well now we really don't have a quorum. No, we do not. <laughs> we can't even end the meeting if we want to. We can't even talk long. about this. We can't talk about anything <laughs> except to your job, Taylor. <laughs> we can talk about yeah, that. So I'm applying. Yeah, I'm just applying for a bunch of stuff I see on LinkedIn. Um, not there aren't too many sustainability positions. Like it's those. That's
police department. We believe in equity. Thing. Yeah, I'm trying to rest my brain on that one. Can you remind me to do that after? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you, you'll take care of calling somebody about the car later? Okay. Dory, if we could circle back to the item you wanted to add at 32 about the green... Green fleet. Green fleet. Could you talk about that real quick? Yep, let me pull it up again. Okay. Well, I mean, I've got kind of two thoughts here. One is that we just take all of 32 out and just say, like, works with the sustainability framework and city staff, including areas identified in the STAR plan, and just kind of okay. try to trim it like that. Yeah. Or add in the green fleets to, like, as an F or something like that. Because the green me, fleet, the guy, I mean, uh, Tommy and Paul are said that their plan is as soon as things get rolling with that, they're going to continually add. So I think it's part of where, where the city's going anyway. Yes, I just didn't want to be too um, predicting what, Kind of what the plan's going to be called. We haven't even started working with fleet yet. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to assure you that we're still going to accomplish the goal. It's it's still in there that it would be a, a plan to reduce the GHG emissions from city fleet. I'm just not so sure it's going to be called a green fleet plan or that's the form it's going to take. That gotcha. We're not quite there yet. And I'm guessing we don't necessarily know that some of these other things are going to happen either, like the plan to, you know, any of these A through E's. I mean, that's that's what we have so far as, so far in the STAR framework is what we're, you know, in the action plan, what we're working towards. But, so I would be okay, I think, because I, I agree, Karen, that we were trying to like put everything in so that it was captured, but. We wanted to. But now we do want them to, our we want somebody to, to apply. Create an impression with the with the Correct. commission. That Correct. was our goal in doing that. So we did create an impression, but now we need to make it realistic so someone's going to want to do this. Correct. And the thing that happens um, is that you want a job description that will attract a variety of people, and then when they come to an interview, then you tell them a lot of stuff. You know, then you can hand them things and say, you know. Talk, and you can talk about all of this other. You expect at a really good job interview, at least I think. I mean, when I was interviewing for, you know, at universities, you'd go and you'd be shown around and told more about what you do. And yes, to that point, what we usually do is we advertise the job using that um, general statement. Mm -hmm. We don't advertise with all that overwhelming list of um, oh, so essential you're not functions. Oh, advertise with this thing. Right. We'll oh, advertise just with were. that top paragraph, the general oh. statement of the job. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't understand But that. then one of the questions we will hand them, this job description, and we will ask them, you have reviewed this, and is this, are you capable of performing these duties so that we can make sure that hmm. you have any concerns about it, you know, that sort of thing. And if they say, well, I'm not an expert in this and that, well, we you know, like GIS that. is included, and we may not get somebody who has experience with GIS. Right. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. So yeah. for number 32, we're just going to take uh, take out the A, B, C, D, E and put works with sustainability action plan framework or STAR framework or something like mm -hmm. that. In the areas of the STAR framework. So that means they will have to have someone who knows what a STAR framework is, or they can... Well, do I mean... Or something like that, and we may not stick with Star Framework right. forever. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. but so they can Google with that with the sustainability it. actions plan of, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Well, so can you just leave thirty two as works through sustainability action plan framework with city staff and other stakeholders? Yes, yes. yes. yeah. That would be nice and simple. Nito. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> That's good. Karen, a voice of reason. Okay. Phew. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts about this, or are we? Taylor had a thought when when the hubbub happened. Sorry. Okay. I think it was just. I think uh, we were talking about the minimum requirements. Mm -hmm. If the minimum, sure, if somebody comes in and they're extremely qualified and they're willing to do it, then right. I'll probably take them. But if you only get a few people applying and somebody seems like they could do the job, but they only have a bachelor's, then yeah, it's just minimum. I think that's I think that's all right to leave in there. 
I think, and I think this is a very important position for the city that I think, you know, if, if people apply and like the city of Clearwater did and there weren't really qualified people, you wait until you get them. Not to. Well, I think personality is going to weigh into this one heavily. As a coordinator, this needs to be somebody that can mm -hmm. get along with people, can communicate, can inspire people to do things yes, for inspire them. Inspire right? people. Yeah. So. Um, but also has to review, check, and interpret scientific and environmental mm -hmm. reports. Right. <laughs> they, they could with use assistance. assistance with that. Yes. You know, yes. There's, of there's a very qualified group of folks to help. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So are we. Finito. Finito. Feeling good with us? Excellent. Okay. Thank so Thank you. Okay. I am so excited that we moved to this position here. You know, at the, we were at that budget workshop when the budget committee made that um, recommendation to do this and right. now the commission has and yep. It's, it's good. pretty exciting that they that the city okay. it shifted. It was iffy for a second um, from where it was. All right, so um, we we need <laughs> to wrap up tonight's meeting. Um, so we've gotten through item three. So we'll carry over member areas of interest to the next meeting. Yes. And then also a conversation about a timeline for community input to get yes. some better understanding of, of how and when that's coming. And then we will work on um, the next item, which is, I will hang on just a second, equity and empowerment. Mm. And then we have education, arts, and community, and we are done going through the STAR framework. So that's why I wanted to have the conversation about community input, because now it's, it's time to start planning that yeah. since we're getting close to the end. Um, are so we going to do two sections for next time? Ashley? Um, if, if that's what you guys would like to do. Do you think you really it's more up to you through? than it is no. to us? Yeah, do you guys honestly think? One. We'll yeah. finish it. It's 841 now. And Correct. Yeah. yeah. Just so equity and empowerment. Everybody get, get working on equity and empowerment. Equity <laughs> um, and empowerment. And yep. you, Ashley, you'll send us that framework. Yep. That yeah. really helps. Okay. okay. Um, so that's kind of items for next agenda. Could you just say what this timeline of community input I, I I don't, what do you mean by that? And why so I'm, I'm trying to get an understanding of when we are going to be seeking community input on the STAR framework, on our recommendations from the community, okay. because in order to continue to move forward, we need to get some community input on what we have selected okay. to be able to move forward. So talking about how and when that's going to happen. Good. Okay. No public comments? Staff comments? I had mine already. I have no comments. Committee comments. Okay, briefly, I just wanted to be, I wanted to get consensus to share that IPCC report with the Board of Commissioners and then also to all of the candidates um, because like that report is unequivocal that human influence and also the accompanying Axios article that was sent to you all. Are right. you guys okay with me forwarding that on to the Board of Commissioners and yes. saying we'd like you to read this and be aware of this? Yes. Okay. Oh, it's yeah. not a startling thing. <laughs> no. But it is, it is educational for yes. some people that have not been really yeah. just, clued just, in on it. Yep. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's part of our educational piece that that's helpful. Okay. Any other comments? All right. We are adjourned at 843. Thank you all. Thank you.